everyone. I'd like to call to order this committee of the whole meeting of the Council of the Town of Saugeen Shores. Welcome all members of the committee this evening and welcome everyone who's watching us on the live stream. We're glad that you're with us. The second item on the agenda is disclosure of pecuniary interest. Ask any member if you have one of those you'd like to declare at this time. The Vice Deputy Mayor. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, item uh, 7.2.1, uh, bylaw to amend the Cenotaph Park Bylaw 108, 2006. Uh, 2006, I was uh, advised by the Integrity Commissioner. I do chair the, uh, you know, the Port Algon Cenotaph Committee, Mr. Mayor, and uh, so I'll be declaring a, a conflict of interest on that item tonight. Thank you. Just to be clear, that's 7.2.2, correct? Uh, correct. Sorry. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Good enough. Any other pecuniary interest to declare this evening? Seeing none, of course, you can do that anytime if you need to. We have no additions, deletions, or amendments to the agenda. We do have three requests to speak in the open forum this evening. And just before I call the open forum uh, speakers, I just remind uh, them all that uh, council forwards three minutes to individuals speaking in the open forum. We do have a pretty active agenda this evening and a few people who want to speak. So we're going to hold you to that uh, timeline and ask you to respect that. So uh, without further ado, our first one is from Norma Dudgeon and she's here to talk to us about the amendment to the Cenotaph Park bylaw. Ms. Dudgeon. Good evening, everyone. Can everybody Good. hear me? Yes, we can. The floor is yours. Right. Good. Thank you for allowing me a few minutes to speak on behalf of the Cenotaph Committee and the Royal Canadian Legion. In 2005, when we approached the town to move the cenotaph from the library to the Long Bowling Green area, we were met with much enthusiasm. The main objective was to get the crowds away from the main highway on Remembrance Day and to use the green space to create a community park. We completed the park in 2006, and as all of you know, it is a place of beauty. It is also a place of respect where community and Legion members gather not only on Remembrance Day, but throughout the entire year to pay homage to our soldiers or maybe say a prayer for a son and daughter who is in the service. It has been an ongoing problem with people letting their dogs poop on the grass and not cleaning it up. This is a community park, not a dog park as some would like to think. In the summer, there is always someone sitting in the park or a mother with her baby on a blanket, just relaxing. And the last thing we need is people stepping in poop. I have had the honor of dog poo on my shoe when I spoke on Remembrance Day to the school children a few years ago and had to sit in our church service with a bad smell. Some of you might question why council should make this park a dog-free zone and not other parks. The difference is Cenotaph Park is also a place of respect and honor to our veterans. The Cenotaph Fund has contributed approximately $20,000 in the last couple of years with new benches that should be installed in a few weeks. The upgrade of security cameras and a new Cenotaph stone dedicated to our Canadian Armed Forces. We take much pride in this park and continue to upgrade as the need arises. We humbly request that Council honor our wish to make the Cenotaph Park a dog-free zone with the exception of service dogs so that our community can enjoy the peace and beauty we have created for them. I thank you for your time, councillors. Thank you, Ms. Dudgeon. Have a good evening. Thank you. That moves us on then to our second uh, open forum uh, presentation from John Mann, here to speak to us about uh, the uh, project update for the CCV. Uh, Mr. Mann, I uh, don't see you there. Oh, there you are. All right, Hi, Kevin. can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. You have three minutes, John. Thank you. Uh, I'm speaking tonight on the uh, update uh, information report on the Cedar Crescent Village uh, proposed for the main beach. That update uh, fails to even mention the SVCA Zuzek report that condemns the Cedar Village uh, uh, proposal. It doesn't even mention it. 
And it doesn't mention the fact that uh, the Zuzek report, that's VCA Zuzek report, uh, condemned the shore plan engineering report. Uh, I've seen a lot of reports in my career and I've never seen one so critical of the shore plan engineering report. The information report uh, that is being presented tonight says that the shore plan in light of the Zuzek report uh, did another report. But this, uh, uh, then the information report goes on to say, and did not substantially change its report. So the uh, short plan engineering report stays essentially the same. That was roundly criticized, unbelievably condemned uh, by the Zuzek report. Why isn't this in the report and attached to the report? Uh, in addition, uh, the, uh, they go, uh, what, what is even more crazy is the fact that our town of Saugeen Shores um, hired the expert that Danini and, and his proponents used, the, the shore plan engineering. Our taxpayer dollars is being paid to the shore plan engineering report that was wrongly criticized, biased and everything else. And it wasn't even tendered. It wasn't even tendered to an engineering uh, report that is unbiased. How is that possible? And, and, uh, uh, and the other thing is we're paying for both. The taxpayers of Saugeen Shores is paying not only for the SVCA uh, Zuzek report, but we're, we're, we're paying for the shore plan engineering report that's conflicting with both. I mean, they're, they're, they're both uh, fighting one another. And now you're asking for a hearing in front of the SPCA to compete. Two government agencies that are paying using our tax dollars because the hearing costs a fortune. Uh, uh, everything you're doing is costing us money and you're competing one another. Uh, the SPCA is to protect our beach, our relic beach, our legendary beach. And you're fighting the experts on that that say this project That's, can't uh, go three forward. minutes there, John. So we're going to have yeah, to you get, call uh, it there. So thanks well, very I was, much. I was uh, barred by, uh, I, I, John, that's three minutes. So we're going to have to end it there. Thanks very much. So we're going to move on then to our third and final uh, open forum presentation this evening, which is from Neil Minaj. And he's here to talk to us about uh, the council report on Ivings Drive and Goddard Street Intersection Award. Mr. Minaj, there he is. Evening, Neil. Hi there. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. You've got three minutes, Neil. All right. Thank you all for this time. Um, I'd just like to offer my support for the award of the tender at uh, Ivings Drive and Goddard Street intersection. As presented, uh, it will be presented in the council meeting. This is an important Port Elgin project. No, no, no question about it. Um, I have uh, many times driven that intersection. And in particular, it's, it's interesting how it's worked with the detour this year. Um, yeah, notwithstanding first world and pandemic issues, this road change has been requested by the public and members of council over time. And your budget pro process actually secured a modest government grant. And it's supported by the transportation master plan. The key emerging trends, problems and opportunities, section 5.3 said transportation system improvements are needed to serve anticipated growth. And we certainly have the growth there. Table 6.10 recommends intersection improvements. Um, I'd like to remind you that this left turn lane is very much a safety issue. Cars cut from lane to lane to avoid others turning left when they're blocked in the intersection. People still drive through the Circle K um, parking lot to, to get to the left turn. They cut across the southbound traffic to do that. And why? Because I've seen it, that's why. And, and the, the local businesses on the other side, they're gonna benefit from this as well. Um, there's two functioning businesses now, at least two and maybe three, and there'll be a fourth when, the, when that project is completed on the, on the east side. What I drew your attention to is I sent you an email also looking at the slip road. The, 
the piece of slip lane that, that comes, uh, if you're driving south, it, it uh, allows you to access the uh, Giant Tiger area parking lot. And certainly people still use that left. And I said to you that it was, it was banned at one time, then it was opened up. And now if you, can, if you continue to leave that slip lane there, uh, people will, and I've seen it happen recently, after the traffic has cleared the intersection at Ivings Drive, they're blocked again by people turning left across into the parking lot. Um, I can feel your pain when you say yes to this increased cost significantly over budget, uh, but saying no to a government grant is surely is a similar type of pain. It will be. Well, finally, my hope is you consider our future and our growth as it would be disappointing, so to speak, if you were to take a left turn in opposition to this left turn project. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much. Have a good evening, Neil. All right, uh, so that's the end of our open forum uh, presentations this evening. We don't have any delegations this evening. We do not have a public meeting. So that moves us on to report of municipal officers and committees. And uh, we have um, uh, 7.2 general government. And the first report is a staff report on the municipal service delivery review, current state assessment. And we have, uh, we have uh, Diane Glebe, there she is, uh, to give the presentation, Diane. Thank you and uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. The town has undertaken a municipal service delivery review project with our chosen consultants, Strategy Corps. Uh, today, you are invited to receive the current state assessment summary report, uh, which is the first of two reports that will be provided to you. With us tonight from Strategy Corps are Chris Loretto, he is principal and the management consulting practice leader for Strategy Corps. And we also have Chris Andro, who is Strategy Corps' project manager. Uh, they are here to explain the report and respond to any questions that you may have. And as I was thinking about it, I can't go wrong by saying I'm gonna hand this over to Chris to uh, take us through the report. Great, uh, thanks, Diane, your worship, uh, members of council. It's a real pleasure to be uh, with you this evening. As uh, Diane said, I'm Chris Loretto. I'm a principal of Strategy Corp. And along with my colleague, Chris Andreu, it's the two Chris's. We keep things nice and simple, so you only have to memorize one name when working with us. Uh, we're, we're pleased to present this evening uh, the current state uh, component of our service delivery review project with the town of uh, Sogging Shores. Um, and while I'm loading my screen, I, I just want to, to mention what the purpose of the current state report is for members of council and how it relates to what will be coming to council a little bit later on um, uh, in the, the part two report that uh, Diane referenced. The purpose of the current state report is really for us to understand the organization and to feed back that understanding of the organization uh, to you um, so that we can, uh, based on our understanding and making sure that we got our, our facts and figures right, uh, be able to uh, digest that and then think through where there may be, uh, based on where we think there may be improvement opportunities, what those improvement opportunities may look like um, and what kinds of recommendations we should be making to you in terms of improving um, the, uh, the ability of the, uh, of the town to uh, deliver the, the, the services that uh, your residents uh, rely on. And so um, this, this report will demonstrate our understanding of, of, of your town uh, so far. Um, and also begin to identify areas where we think there may be improvement opportunities and which we'll focus on in the next uh, stage of, uh, of this project. And uh, I will go through the presentation because I know members of council received it in advance and, and I'm sure you've all had an opportunity to look through it, but I figure it might be uh, helpful to go through it uh, quickly and then be able to answer your questions uh, at the end. Um, so our understanding of the town is that, uh, you know, you were created through amalgamation back in 1998, um, and you have the uh, good fortune of having, uh, you know, a, a really strong overall local economy. You, you certainly have uh, an anchor employer in terms of uh, Bruce Power, um, and that you're a community in transition and that you're facing uh, significant growth pressures, and we know that you've grown significantly um, between the last census periods, and we know and understand that that growth is uh, continuing to happen as people choose uh, Soggy and Shores as a place to live, work, and raise their families. And so you're looking from moving to from a small town to a mid-sized town fairly quickly, at least when we're talking about the evolution of municipalities. And so this uh, service delivery review has really been undertaken to um, help you understand and for you and, and, and the administration to work together 
uh, to uh, you know ensure that the the, uh, the municipality, the corporation, is in a position to continue to support this growth and meet the demands of residents as as the town continues uh, to grow. And so, as I said, you, you, your your population is increasing, and we know. Uh, you're fast approaching the 20,000 uh, resident uh, resident mark, um, and and you uh, are fortunate uh, in, in terms of the local economy to have uh, you know above average uh, median after tax household income. Uh, in your age distribution, uh, while there are more of us 40 somethings and 50 somethings there, you still have a strong uh, cohort demog demographically in the younger age bracket. So a fairly uh, a good distribution. Uh, from a demographics perspective, and that obviously, based on the demographics, uh, creates uh, current and future demands for services for which you'll want to be prepared. And we also know that the municipality has done a, a really solid job of um, uh, anchoring its fiscal position and beginning to save for tomorrow, um, as well as invest in the services that people need today. Um, uh, by uh, uh, you know, prudently uh, you know, balancing your, your budget, but also taking any surplus and putting those in rainy day funds that can help fund some, some of the demands, particularly infrastructure demands that you're gonna have to keep up with the growth that your municipality is, is facing. And so that's why we've been brought in. You're growing and you wanna understand how you position the organization over the next few years to continue to support this growth and to ensure that you're delivering the high, continue to deliver high quality services um, to your residents. And so we've been brought on, uh, we've done a number of these across the, the province and we're really here to help, you know, look at the data and, and talk to you. And we talked to all members of council as part of uh, this process thus far. Um, and we said we'd be back to you and here we are with the current state. We're also looking at you. So understanding firsthand from the administration and from council's perspectives, um, what, what you see is working well and where you see opportunities for improvement. We're also looking at you in the context of a number of uh, benchmark municipalities um, to understand how you perform relative to them, how you're structured relative uh, to them. And we'll talk about that uh, in a second. We've been engaging with staff uh, throughout the process uh, because at the end of the day, uh, when we leave you with our recommendations, uh, we go away and it, in the, the hard work of implementing the recommendations as they may be adopted by council falls to management and staff. And so having their buy-in and having them help craft uh, uh, some of the solutions uh, in, and identifying the issues in the first hand is really important to us as part of our as part of our uh, as part of our overall process. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Uh, it does say though that you know when we look at an organization, we look at a number uh, of areas: governance and strategy, service delivery, people and culture, and um, and process and, and technology. So as we've gone through to understand the current state of the organization, we're, we've looked at all those things. And we looked at it by department. Um, and uh, we uh, have a fairly good understanding. And as I said, we've looked at all departments with the, uh, so all the departments that are presented here on this slide are, in the, are within our scope uh, to review. Um, and uh, we've, uh, we've uh, had uh, very good discussions with each of the departments and, and have uh, built uh, detailed profiles of each of the departments so that we really understand what services are being delivered um, including all those services that, you know, may not be uh, the highest exposure, but it's really important for us to understand what, you know, all parts of the organization, what they do um, from A to Z as we go and assess the, the current state of the organization. Um, and so looking at the current state, as I said, it's all about setting the table for the next part of the project, which is um, you know, we'll have some uh, ideas as to where there may be improvement opportunities. We'll share some of those uh, with you this evening. We, we're not at the point where, to make recommendations tonight, so I won't be in a position to say we would recommend this or that. Uh, but it is uh, based on the current state assessment going into those uh, uh, improvement opportunities and coming up with recommendations that make sense uh, for the municipality to uh, pursue things that will deliver greater uh, service quality, improve efficiency and effectiveness, and also position you uh, to deal with some of the growth, growth pressures that, uh, that, that, uh, that, that uh, you're facing uh, around things like attainable housing, for example. And, uh, and uh, that's something we certainly heard from a number of counselors and from staff as we've been moving through this process. Um, in terms of the overall strengths and some of the, or the weaknesses um, that we've noticed, um, the, the town, it, from a strengths perspective, it, it has uh, a strong resident-centric approach that starts a council that carries through uh, the administration. Everybody's committed to delivering a, a high quality public service 
for public services to, to residents, and that, that, uh, that carries through the organization, as I've said. Um, and that is reflected in having committed and dedicated staff, staff who are committed to getting the job done at, at, the, at the end of the day. Um, to make uh, to to make you guys proud and also to do to to do right by residents. You have a strong council, um, and uh, thank uh, God bless you for that. It's not the case in every community, um, and the council works well together and is seen as advancing town uh, priorities and working collaboratively with the administration uh, to make that happen. And as I noted before, you you, you have uh, solid financial strength as as a town. You have a very secure financial uh, position for today and uh, uh, going forward um, as well. From a weaknesses perspective, um, there, there, we think there are areas for improvement in terms of the level of interdepartmental collaboration. Um, you know, it's not uncommon in, in many organizations for people to feel like work is being done in silos. Um, and so uh, you're not unique in that respect, but what we can do to uh, improve the level of coordination and collaboration across departments, uh, particularly around enterprise priorities is something that is important, uh, that is important for an organization. And I apologize for my puppy in the background. Uh, he wants to play now at the most inopportune time. Um, the other thing we've noticed is that, that um, the departments don't have um, necessarily clearly articulated service standards or key performance indicators uh, that uh, they report against those service standards that uh, they report on uh, regularly. Um, so we see this as an opportunity where there uh, is likely need for improvement in, in, in figuring out what makes sense uh, for the organization, not for us to come in as consultants and say, here's the uh, Harvard Business School uh, textbook case for what you should be doing, but really beginning to understand what makes sense in terms of better understanding the services you deliver, understanding the capacity that is required to deliver those services and to be able to inform budgeting business planning processes using some of those metrics and um, being able to report those to council to help you in your decision making processes as well. Um, internal communications um, is seen as something that has improved in recent years, but there is always an opportunity to, con to uh, continue to improve that. Um, and you have a, 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 a communications coordinated position, um, but um, there's still a sense that not everybody in the organization understands what the priorities are and uh, what, is, what is happening in, in a timely fashion within the broader organization. And then the last is, you know, we, we do think uh, are observing that there, there may be a need to refresh the organizational structure of the town, there, there seem to be certain functions and responsibilities that are in, uh, in areas and have reporting accountabilities that are atypical of what you would find in a, in a typical municipality, um, which um, we look at that because we, we do get concerned about the, you know, uh, what that may mean in terms of overall service quality and, and be able to, being able to deliver a service uh, efficiently. Um, as I said, um, so, you know, those are the strengths and weaknesses. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on the next few slides other, to, other than to say you're in, you're in a solid financial position. You're in solid financial position when we look at you on a standalone basis and when we look, look at you at the municipal affairs and housing benchmarks that are set um, to, uh, to test the, the general fiscal health of the municipality. We also know that in the context of peer comparators, um, you are, are healthy as well. You're not, you're not, not an outlier, uh, good or bad, relative to your, the peer comparators that we picked. And that was uh, uh, Midland, Coburg, uh, Wasega Beach, the town of LaSalle, uh, Goderich, and the town of Blue Mountains. Um, and uh, we know uh, in terms of where we did see you know, potential issues um, in the finances, one is around water and uh, using the rate base to recover the costs of delivering the service. And we know you have a prudent plan to get to full cost recovery for your water service. Uh, so we're not concerned there. And, you know, we certainly encourage you to stay on that journey. And we also notice relative to peers that you do spend more per capita, you know, you, you spend more and you also subsidize more uh, per capita on uh, recreation services relative to what you recover uh, through uh, recreation fees. We're not saying that's good, bad, or indifferent at, at the moment, other than to say it is, it is an area where you do differ from your peer comparators. And it's always a, a 
a policy and a political choice for councils as to how much you're going to recover through uh, the fees you charge end users for a service uh, like recreation uh, versus what uh, the, the, the taxpayer is going to contribute to make that service available at an affordable rate. Uh, and it's always just something that we like to encourage municipalities to keep an eye on because there is obviously inherently an equity issue um, if it gets too far out of whack. Um, between what is recovered through fees and, and what is provided uh, from, from the rate base. Um, in terms of uh, two other areas um, where we looked at you in the context of peer comparators, we did notice that from a, a permanent full-time staff perspective, um, you, are, um, you are lower than, uh, than your peers. Um, and, uh, you know, that, um, that uh, you know, indicates to us that you may be under-resourced in some areas uh, of the municipality, particularly where you are facing significant uh, growth pressures and, and the need for a service. Um, and there are also some, as I said, some substantial differences in how you, you, you've organized your administration versus the peer comparators. And, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But, you know, the, the, the big things are, or certain, certain accountability uh, accountabilities are within the departmental structure. Um, for instance, human resources, um, building fleet, health and safety. Um, some of these responsibilities are not where you would typically see them um, in, a, in a municipal administration. Uh, just uh, as I said, um, we noticed that you're lower relative to the, to the average, and with the exception of Goderich, uh, the the other peer comparators in terms of permanent full time staff, you do have a significant um, part time funded positions, and and that is reflected in a number of departments, um, you know, such as works and and recreation services, where you do use a lot of uh, part time or seasonal uh, staff, um, but it, it's that full time permanent number that. Um, that we'll draw your attention to just at this point. We haven't uh, made it made a decision yay or nay as to whether good, bad, or indifferent again, um, but it is, is something where you are a bit of an outlier relative to your peers. Um, before I wrap up, just want to talk a little bit about our observations, uh, you know, kind of department by department. As I said, we looked at each of the departments, um, starting with protective services. Um, we note the staff are high performing and dedicated. There's a succession risk that you face because you know a lot falls on the director, who is also the fire chief, and there isn't necessarily a plan or structure in place um, to replace uh, him uh, should he um, uh, should he not be able to fulfill uh, or should he go elsewhere um, uh, at some point in the future. Um, when we looked at it, uh, the comparators do tend to have a deputy fire chief who helps with workloads, also ensures a succession. Um, uh, a succession risk mitigation uh, in terms of that position. Uh, we noticed too, there, there are some things that are under you know, protective services that are typically found elsewhere in the municipal administration, particularly the CBO, uh, fleet and health and safety, things that are typically with a, you know, a planning and building services um, or with the corporate services or public works um, or with an HR function. Um, corporate services uh, working well um, what we notice relative, uh, what, you know, there, there are certainly improvements to be made in, in financial processes and particularly how the budgeting process um, uh, works on an enterprise function and people feed into that, but there are also uh, processes within the departments uh, in terms of running uh, finance on a day-to-day -day basis. And you know, I know you've had another third party report and staff are eager to, to work on that and build on that. Um, HR is one of the outliers we found just in terms of, you know, there are some situations, particularly in larger municipalities, where it is in corporate services, not unusual, but in um, organizations the size of Sogging Shores because of its importance um, and the, the enterprise function that it does play um, in, in a municipality, we typically see it as a, uh, as a uh, position and a function that reports directly to the CAO. Uh, because it it, uh, it it applies just as importantly to every department within uh, within the administration. From an infrastructure and development perspective, um, one of the things we no notice is that the beach duties are separated uh, between infrastructure development and community services, um, which you know has led to some question as whether or not it's it's, it's impacting service coordination and whether or not it's creating discrepancy um, in services. Um, both, team, you know, the team and in infrastructure development works hard. Um, work workload is reported as an issue. 
um, with teams struggling to, to keep up with uh, projects and equipment sharing across departments um, was noted as a, you know, a particular area uh, that sometimes caused friction. Um, in terms of uh, staffing, you, you know, infrastructure has a higher proportion of permanent part-time and seasonal staff. In terms of its permanent full-time staff, it's in line with what we see uh, in the comparators. Um, and then, as I said, um, fleet and building, we typically would see in a, in a works or, or, and or planning uh, function, which is currently in, in your case with uh, protective uh, services. And we also note uh, there is a misalignment in hours worked between managers in the department in, in public works and engineering and what staff work uh, uh, what staff work per week before overtime kicks in. And so that may be something that we take a look at and, and, and determine uh, whether or not it's, it's, it's an area where there needs to be some alignment uh, and adjustment made. In terms of uh, community services, um, we, we, you know, in terms of external communications, there's limited promotions and public outreach. We think that uh, we know and understand that, and, and, and there's certainly a sentiment that more can be done to uh, attract utilization of the facilities um, and the programs that you have on offer. Um, the director's capacity is really focused on day to day and, and doesn't uh, free up much time to focus on longer term strategic issues facing uh, the department. And as you're, you know, importing folks from the big city, so to speak, there is an increasing user expectation for people who are used uh, to, to uh, recreation services, for instance, in a larger municipal context. Um, and so that's driving up expectations around, uh, around the service. Um, as I mentioned, the cost recovery issue versus what is subsidized from the uh, from the from the tax base. Um, we think there's also an opportunity to harmonize uh, what a standard work week looks like in terms of uh, hours. And the, the other thing too is that you know, kind of a, a bit of a a bit of a secret you have to scratch at to really understand is that there's a significant facilities management, um, not just beyond the you know the, the typical rec facilities you would expect to be uh, administered in a department like this, but there are also um, you know other facilities, uh, condos, medical buildings, the airport that fall under this portfolio, um, and that doesn't exist amongst comparators, and that that certainly creates a work pressure. Uh, for the department. Lastly, in terms of strategic initiatives, um, you know, we, what we heard is the the you know whether or not um, really understanding what the role of the communication coordinator is, um, you know, what that what that per person's relationship is relative to, de to the departments versus corporate or enterprise wide uh, communications, um, and then you know whether or not the strategic initiative should be a standalone department or if its functions should be distributed elsewhere and that capacity freed up uh, to to uh, be put to other use where there are priorities for the uh, for the organization. Uh, and then in terms of CAO and clerk, um, you know, we, we heard a lot. We looked more closely at the CAO's responsibilities um, as well. Um, most comparators, uh, CAOs had direct reports, including HR communications and strategy, which are distributed within the organization uh, right now. Um, we looked at the question, a number of you raised a, the, a deputy CAO concept. Uh, none of the others have a deputy CAO, um, but what, you know, one of the things you need to look at when you're looking at this is, do you have the right, right people, the right functions reporting into the CAO, and do you have an appropriate span of control and distribution of responsibilities? Um, within the municipality. Um, and so the other thing we did hear from councils around attainable housing, uh, we looked at them, some of the comparators are facing some of the, the housing affordability pressures that uh, your town is facing and some have taken the step of actually developing strategies and or uh, also uh, recruiting uh, people uh, to lead uh, the execution of those strategies. And so that's something that is certainly on our radar. So uh, in wrap up there, you know, as we go into the next phase of this project, uh, we think there are improvement opportunities in terms of how um, the organ organizations are structured to potentially improve service delivery and enhance the collaboration across departments and enhance uh, productivity uh, overall. Um, we believe there's work to be done on key performance indicators and having basic sets and, and that are relevant to the businesses and support uh, decision making and resource allocation. Um, this will enhance organizational knowledge. This will improve decision making and, and, and improve uh, your ability to make uh, service decisions to enhance quality uh, or to redeploy capacity to where you need to. 
Um, and then we also, uh, you know, want to look at ensuring that the, the finance processes are improved and, and that, you know, understanding what the department is, what the treasurer is going to need in terms of helping that, both in terms of just the day-to-day -day financial arrangement, arrangements of collect, collecting taxes, dealing with accounts receivable and accounts payable, those types of things, but also, you know, um, making budgeting a whole of enterprise exercise and improving the efficacy of that uh, um, uh, that overall process to support better long-term decision-making, um, and that uh, goes directly to your role as counselors. Um, so with that, Your Worship, I want to uh, say thank you very much. The next steps will be we're going into the next uh, phase, uh, looking at those improvement opportunity areas, coming up with the ideas and recommendations that we'll be bringing back to council, um, and we look forward to being able to share our thinking and, and some of the recommendations when we next see you. Um, so thank you very much for this opportunity to present the current state and happy to answer any questions. Very good. Thank you, Chris and Chris. And uh, I'll just read the recommendation, then we can take any questions or comments. It's recommended that Council receive the current state assessment summary. Questions or comments from members? As Vice Deputy Mayor. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And thank you, uh, Chris, for your, for your presentation and uh, just a couple of comments and a couple of questions. Uh, I was interested to hear you say that uh, you know we're in solid financial position, and I think all of council um, see that. You know, and we've heard from Daniel Wader and our CAO that we're in very good, solid financial position. So it's it's nice that you heard that and that you're seeing that. Um, another observation that council works well together, and I I agree. It's a very cohesive council. I think we work extremely well together, and and uh, we're getting a lot of stuff done. And um, some favorable with the community and some not so favorable, but we're getting things done and, and I think we work very well together. And uh, that's a good thing. Um, on page 17, you talk about uh, planning and uh, you mentioned about most comparators have internal planning departments. However, they do not have um, access to a shared service delivery option. Chris, are you finding that with the comparables, uh, the comparators that um, you know, Saga Beaches, Midlands, and Goderich, uh, do they have their own planning department? Is that what you're saying? Whereas we, you know, partner with Bruce County, obviously, and receive a lot of our planning services from, from the county and, and seems to be functioning fairly well. But I have always had that question as a member of council. You know, at what point in time you see the city of Owen Sound with three planners, for example, in their own, make up their own department? At what point in time, you know, what, what are you seeing you know, with the study in terms of, we have Jay Posner, our planning supervisor. Um, and then of course we have our services at the upper tier level with Bruce County. We do a very, very effective job for us. Mm -hmm. But I'm just wondering at some point in time, do you see that when you talk about they don't have access to um, you know, shared service delivery options, would those same municipalities not have planning services at the upper tier level where they're partnering with those municipalities or are, are, are those those communities, do they have their own planning departments? Some like LaSalle and, you know, I know Blue Mountains because we've worked with them, they do have their own planning departments. Uh, it, it's a bit all over the place. It depends really what is on offer from the, the upper tier uh, and how competent and capable, quite frankly, uh, the upper tier is in, in delivering the service. Um, in, in looking at it, um, in full disclosure, we did the planning services review for, <laughs> for the upper tier in your case. Um, but in looking at it just from your perspective, you seem to be getting a good quality service. Um, the, um, you know, the, you know, the, the agreement with the, with the upper tier um, is, is seem, seems clear. Um, and so, I, I, you know, I, I don't think you need to migrate away from that. In fact, it's, it's yeah. advantageous yeah. now. Now, you know, I think what, where we're, you know, where we may look is, okay, you, you know, it's always important that planning is working, you know, uh, even though it's an upper tier relationship, you know, uh, that you have eyes wide open into how you know, planning and building and, and, you know, works, all those things are, are working to, 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 together uh, and to, to ensure that the, 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 the process from concept all through to, you know, the commissioning of facilities is, uh, is, is working well. And so that, you know, we're, you know, as we, we noted that we, we wonder why buildings and protective services and, and, and things of that nature, we're going to look critically as to whether or not, um, you know, does it make sense to regroup those in a way? Okay. Yeah. Thank, 
Thanks for that, Chris. And I, yeah, and I have a, a sense that uh, you know, planning, you know, having your own planning department is is a is a whole is a whole big a big cost as well, and it brings a big price tag with it. So I just this question I had, just in uh, opinion, I know there's lots of other questions around the table. So um, just refresh my memory again when the next report will be presented to council with with concrete recommendations. We're, we're uh, and Diane can correct me or Chris can correct me just because I keep many work plans going in my head, but towards the end of September is uh, is what we're targeting um, to, to, to bring a, uh, the next report to council. Okay, thanks, thanks, Chris, thanks again. Uh, if I can just confirm, yeah, yeah. Uh, we're saying end of September, by the time it gets to council, it could be into the early part of October. Okay, thanks for that, uh, Council Mayette. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thanks, Chris and Chris, for your report, and Diane, of course, for her input. You know, it was I could see it in there. Um, my question is: uh, when, when I read the report, I was I was uh, expecting to see maybe some comments about uh, some of the things. What, as, as residents think about delivery of services from the municipality, the things that typically come to mind to them are um, garbage collection, um, you know, water and wastewater. Uh, police. Those are the things they see on the street on a regular basis. And in our municipality, we uh, we enjoy having our own internal police force, which we uh, we have our own municipal force. And but the other two, like garbage collection, we wholly contract out. As do we our water and wastewater management of our uh, two facilities or several facilities for water and wastewater. Um, do you see your report uh, making any commentary on? Uh, the strategies that we employ currently. I, I'm not saying the strategies are bad. I think we have a, a fairly good relationship with our contractors and our internal police force. Uh, but just when you do comparators to other municipalities, the, the four or five that you listed there, whether or not they employ the same strategies and whether or not they enjoy a higher or lower costing on and any or, or any all or all of those uh, services I, I mentioned. Yeah, I, so Councillor, I don't think we're going to comment on the strategies. Uh, what I think we what we will comment is, you know, what are you keeping track of from a performance perspective, and, and how do you know the service is performing to what your what your desired expectations are? So, in the case of waste management, you're part of a seven municipality. Uh, you know, seven municipalities are you know um, members of a not for profit that deliver it, um, and so what are we measuring in terms of that service? Um, to understand the, the service quality, um, you know, uh, and I think so looking at, um, you know, the volumes that are picked up, you know, um, looking at uh, service complaints, um, you know, volumes, looking at, um, you know, uh, how, you know, the, the types of the types of complaints you're getting, how quickly they're resolving themselves. Um, if there's a miss, you know, things like miss pickups, how long is it taking from, you know, somebody flagging that to the, the, um, to the, uh, the, the, the refuse actually being picked up. So I think it's more, in, you, you need some basics still before you say, you know, the model's not right. I think you, you need some basics in terms of, you know, what are we measuring and are we satisfied that things are going in the right, right direction or if they're not, are we in a position to go back to our contractors and say, we expect to see uh, an improvement in this, that, or the other um, thing that has you worried. I would say it's the same with the, with the aqua contract too. Now, the, you know, from a cost perspective, uh, obviously you're not unique in terms of using using Aqua, but you know, understanding, um, you know, uh, understanding uh, some metrics there, I think will help you better better understand what next time around you, you may want to do. Uh, and if it's to re, re up with Aqua, then you know, sharpening pencils there from a contract perspective. Well, suffice to say, that wasn't necessarily part of the scope of what you guys were uh, tasked to come up with, right? Correct. Yeah. All right, and, and just one more thing. When you when you uh, list the comparators, a lot of those municipalities you listed are quite familiar to us. Uh, we often get compared to Sega Beach and Collingwood and Meaford and that. Um, did you ever consider using Port Hope as one of your comparators? We have some uh, similarities, past and present, with that uh, municipality, and uh, interesting to see how we stack up against them. Yeah, yeah, so I, you know, Chris can correct me. I, you know, Port Hope uh, may have been on there. We may have, uh, you know, uh, I think uh, Quinty West was was too big, but um, it, we had to draw a line. And what we tried to do is achieve a mix of not, you know, in terms of you know, population, geography, um, s service scope, 
Um, we also tried to, you know, Port Hope certainly a good example of a municipality that's growing, but also, you know, LaSalle, the reason LaSalle's there is there's, there's a municipality that has really grown and, and it's been largely residential driven. So looking at, you know, trying to use them as a little bit of a you know, look-see into the future of what could be ahead for Soggy and Shores. So um, yeah, they didn't make the final list. Um, uh, we could have an infinite list, obviously, but um, we did try to make sure there was a mix of good comparators, um, including having an eye to the future. Okay, just a suggestion. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Further questions or comments, uh, Councillor Smith. Thank you, and through you, uh, the last question from Councillor Mayette was uh, along the same lines of thinking as what I had here, uh, related to comparable comparator com communities. Uh, and I wondered, one of the themes that I took out of the report was around uh, full-time versus part-time staff. There was a really uh, meaningful slide that spoke to the differences in, in where Godridge and, and us stacked up, but then differed from many of the other communities represented. Uh, I'm curious if in your next stage of the report, if we will be able to see the benefits. Um, obviously, there's some efficiencies to be gained with more full-time staff, but also some additional expenses. And if there's a proportional uh, budgetary representation that we could see in the next report in terms of what that would look like if we were to increase full-time staff. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Absolutely. Uh, and then my last point was just as it relates to succession planning, I assume uh, that will ex exceed beyond the, the one individual that was listed. And, and I think succession planning is a theme that uh, we can certainly see building in your future report as well. And I'm keen to see that. Absolutely. All right. Thanks very much. Further input from members. I don't see any. Well, thanks to the three of you for uh, for the uh, presentation and uh, I think, uh, I mean, it's really critical. I mean, we're, as you say, a growing community. We're, a, we're uh, transitioning, as you say, from a smaller community into a more medium-sized uh, community. And that requires us to do certain things to manage the organization differently uh, because uh, it becomes a larger organization. And as you can see from some of this, uh, it will need to become larger still to, uh, to manage all the workload that uh, needs to be done in order to keep in order to maintain that uh, consistent uh, service level and quality of life that the municipality has been offering for several decades and we want to continue to offer. So, uh, so this is important work that you're doing. It's a good thing that we got this modernization money from the province in order to help us to do it because uh, it's not something we might have <laughs> initially prioritized uh, for that funding had we not gotten that. So I think it's really positive and um, just looking forward to your report. Sounds like it's going to come either in late September or, or early October. So we'll look forward to that and uh, with that thank you all very much and we'll ask uh, there is a recommendation you've all heard it so we'll ask all in favor that is carried okay thank you we'll move on to the next report which is uh number two staff report on the amendment to cenotaph park bylaw to prohibit dogs and we'll turn it over to the clerk thank you and sure you so we've received and we heard again tonight the request for a dog free zone in the uh, cenotaph park the report before you recommends amending the Cenotaph Park bylaw to restrict the dogs, with the exception of the service dogs, from entering the park. The draft bylaw before you is provided for your consideration tonight. Okay, thank you, Linda. There is a recommendation. I'll read it. It's recommended the council pass a bylaw to amend the Cenotaph Park bylaw uh, 108 2006. Questions or comments from members of the committee? Start with the deputy mayor and work our way around. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And going back to Ms. Um, Dudgeon's presentation, I have attended several Remembrance Day ceremonies the last few years. And as we got down there, the Legion was busy cleaning up. And it took about a half hour to clean up. And nobody wants to be walking through there. It's a place of a remembrance. And, and as she said, it's, it's, it's an important place. We do not be needing to have dogs walking through there. I know everybody likes to have a green space, but this is a, a good bylaw and I hope people will follow along with it. Okay, thank you. Uh, just, I'm just gonna go around my screen. I have Councillor Mayette next. Uh, just quickly, um, I will support this bylaw change. Uh, it's very unfortunate that we find ourselves in this situation and it's, it's just irresponsible pet owners that are making this situation the way it is. Um, being, I think I'm the only dog owner on the on council, so I feel a responsibility to speak up for dog owners. Oh, Jamie, you have a dog, do you? 
No, okay. Um, and I, I certainly, I walk my dogs every day and we, we clean up after our dogs, but uh, it, it's unfortunate that we've brought ourselves to this position that we have to ban dogs from one area or another because uh, a few people are just lazy and not doing the right thing. Um, I'm, I'm not hopeful that this is gonna deter the situation completely, but uh, I will support the bylaw change. Thanks. Okay, Councilor Smith. Uh, thank you. No, I was speaking for those others that uh, do have dogs, which I think there's more than one, <laughs> but that's okay. Um, I do have something to add to this um, through you, Mr. Mayor. I will also be supporting this this evening. However, this is unfortunately a theme I hear about quite often, and not just as it relates to the Cenotaph Park, but um, also on our trails. Uh, I hear about individuals stumbling upon piles of bagged uh, litter and, you know, from dogs or otherwise. And it makes me question the sort of the why exercise of why, why, why. And uh, I did a bit of research on successful waste disposal corporations, and it will come as no surprise that one of the most successful corporations as it pertains to waste disposal is the Walt Disney Company. Uh, I'm not in any way suggesting that we have the means to uh, produce a similar model that they have, but they do have some tried and, two tried and true methods that make their waste disposal successful. The first of which is access to disposal uh, cans. And uh, the rule in Walt Disney Parks is you cannot go 30 feet without one. Uh, so I'd be curious, and I believe this is this is not an ask of the clerk's office, but rather of the parks department, uh, where the location of the nearest waste receptacles are in the downtown core. I know the Port Elgin BIA did um, purchase with the assistance of the town some new bins last year or the year before, perhaps. Uh, but it might be time to just sort of look at the location of those bins and whether there is an opportunity to provide not only more waste um, receptacles, but more importantly, some recycling options as well in the downtown core. I know that's outside of the scope of this particular bylaw, uh, but I will uh, circulate an article on successful uh, trash cans in the Walt Disney Company for those who might be interested. Uh, I think there's more that we can do than simply, to your point, Councillor Mayette, ban dogs, uh, because this, this issue exceeds more than just dog litter uh, and goes to a larger question of why people are choosing not to, and perhaps there's some accountability that we can have as a municipality. Okay, thank you. I had Councillor Schreider. Uh, thank you, and through you. Um, I def I'm a dog owner as well, Dave. So, um, and actually part of my note tonight was I'm a dog owner, but a responsible dog owner. So I was part of um, the development of the Cenotaph. Um, I remember when it was a lawn bowling club and all of the efforts that went on through staff and volunteers um, and things that haven't changed over the last few years. Uh, when I attended the last year's service uh, for Remembrance Day was people like, like Dawn said, um, scrambling around with shovels and, and bags before a very important uh, ceremony. So I will definitely be supporting this, and uh, and it is disappointing that there that uh, it's that that this has to happen. But um, I think we're making the right choice. Okay, I didn't see Councilor Grace or Councilor Rich's hands go up. Do either of them have a comment, Councilor Grace? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I, I will just comment that um, this actually has been a topic of discussion in the Environmental uh, Stewardship um, Ad Hoc Committee um, in terms of, uh, we started talking about it with regard to protection of our natural assets like uh, trails. And, and so I already did make an inquiry to uh, the Director of Community Services just about where such uh, receptacles are located right now. Um, and I think we're waiting for Frank to get back from holiday to give us specific information on that. Um, but um, Jane also did mention that we do have, I think she said about 18 um, distribution. Um, Jane can, can comment on this, but I think 18 places where people in the public on trails can pick up uh, bags. Uh, if they didn't, if they left the house without that, uh, maybe Jane could comment on that. But it is this is a, a, a topic of concern in the environmental committee. The director. Yes, thank you, and and I can certainly make comment. Um, 
Uh, our, I can tell you our, our garbage receptacles are not GIS right now in the community. We know the location of where we have put them, um, but it is our, certainly our goal to have them all GIS. Within our garbage receptacles, we have some that are in ground, um, and each year we add additional ones that are for in ground. We do not have the um, disposable ones for dog waste specifically, only because we are not in the vicinity for a collection agency to collect that and dispose of it, um, how it should be disposed of. So we use those with the same as our garbage receptacles. Um, the dog waste bags, there are a number of, as you indicated, Councillor Grace, receptacles throughout the community. We have not increased those. And we're cognizant of increase, as we increase receptacle cans and receptacle bags, um, it expands our, our budget, I'll say, and we're cognizant of the cost of that. As, and I'll, I'll even make a comment in regard to Councillor Smith's comment for um, blue boxes as well. We simply don't have the staff to to uh, do the um, go through the process of sorting blue boxes at this point. And I can tell you that in the past when we have demonstrated or experienced um, through pilot programs, blue box receptacles, they end up getting garbage thrown in them and they all become waste. Um, so without having the resources to go through them individually, um, hence the reason we have just garbage receptacles in our parks. So hopefully that answers all your questions. So I'll get Councilor Rich and then I come back to the Deputy Mayor. And I'll weigh in. Um, obviously it's a very disrespectful thing in, in a place of, uh, a memoriam that to allow your dog and not and not actually be a responsible dog owner. Obviously, there's got to be some education. Um, make sure that people are know that we're watching and and trying to hold them accountable. And um, you know, it, uh, I think access to bags and receptacles. So I you know give someone the benefit of the doubt that they might have forgotten the bag that one day. I myself am a dog owner. I had to put my dog down not that long ago, but um, I will be a dog owner again. And I always. Uh, um, try to be a responsible one. So um, I'm certainly in support of the motion. Thank you, uh, Councillor, or pardon me, the Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, what we must truly understand is it's not a matter of receptacles being around. It's not a matter of having access to bags. People just don't pick up. You walk along the trails, there's dog poop. Pick it up. We all have dogs. We see people with dogs. There's piles everywhere. When you walk your dog, signs say it. Poop, scoop your poop. So it's plain and simple. Um, we don't need more. Well, we could always use more receptacles, but we have enough. People need to be more uh, considerate. That's the big thing. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so I was, uh, I posted about it on Facebook a couple of years ago. Actually, I was in the Senate staff in Port Elgin and found a lot of uh, dog waste left, but it was all in bags. It had been bagged and thrown on the ground in the Senate staff, a lot of it. And so it's not just a matter of not stooping and scooping, it's a matter of um, intentionally desecrating a monument. Uh, and I think, uh, so um, I'm very hopeful that there aren't very many people in our community who would do that. My guess is, uh, I, have, I have optimism about our community. My guess is that uh, the vast, vast majority of dog owners in our community would not uh, allow their animal or take action themselves to desecrate a war monument. I suspect this is a, a, an act that's taking place because of a very small number of people. And I think, uh, um, I mean, it's, uh, it's extremely offensive, but I, and I have spoken over the weekend to police and bylaw uh, officials and, um, you know, there haven't been a lot of complaints filed about this and there needs to be. Uh, this is already in violation of the Senate Taft Park bylaw. It's actually, in my view, an act of mischief and vandalism, punishable under the criminal code. Uh, and so what we need is uh, to get some complaints uh, and then an investigation. And uh, as it turns out, this is a place where we have a video surveillance system uh, that is recording there all the time. So it shouldn't be a big problem to catch these people. Uh, and, and punish them. So uh, I guess what I would suggest, I, I mean, I'll vote for the uh, change, the bylaw change. I'm not a big fan of banning things, though, particularly a blanket ban uh, against every person in the community targeting what I suspect is an act of a very small number of people who we could catch 
if we dedicated ourselves to it. Uh, so, and we have a video surveillance system, so let's use it. Uh, so what I would like to see, uh, and perhaps uh, staff listening here today can pass this along. Um, I would like to see a stepped up enforcement effort before this bylaw comes back to council. Uh, and I'd like to see if you can catch these people. Uh, and then I'd like to have bylaw or police or both uh, come to the to come to council and tell us about their enforcement efforts before we pass this bylaw. Uh, because I think council really needs to know what enforcement has been taken undertaken before we start banning things uh, or banning people from doing things. That's a pretty that's a pretty aggressive action to take. And we should know that we've tried everything else before we do it. So by, we're not passing the bylaw tonight. We're uh, saying that we're going to consider it later. So let's uh, pass this resolution tonight. Uh, and when it comes when the bylaw comes back, let's hear from our enforcement officers about what actions they've taken. And perhaps they've caught these people. And maybe we don't need to put this ban in place. Uh, but uh, bottom line is this council and the municipality is not going to stand for desecration of this monument or any monument. Uh, it, dedicated to the honored work out of our community. So uh, with that, uh, if there's no further questions or comments, uh, you've heard the resolution, I'll ask all in favor. All right, that moves us on to uh, our infrastructure and development report. We're gonna get the vice deputy mayor back, hopefully he can hear or somebody can get him. There he is, okay. So then that moves us on to infrastructure and development 7.3. Uh, and there's one report there. It's a staff report on a subdivision agreement for Southampton Landing phase two and the director. Thank you and through Mr. Mayor. This subdivision agreement is for the second stage of Southampton Landing uh, located at McNabb and Highway 21. The first stage was constructed with six townhouses on McNabb. The third stage will be in the future and has another uh, 49 single or 39, sorry, single houses. This one will have 40 single homes and one townhouse block. So staff is recommending um, that we move forward with the subdivision agreement. Okay, thank you. There's a recommendation that council pass a bylaw to authorize a subdivision agreement for the Southampton Landing subdivision phase two. Questions or comments? Vice Deputy Mayor. Then Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for that question. And I had uh, a couple comments too. Uh, Amanda, um, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing here that um, we've got single family dwelling units. I don't see, um, I, I, I don't see any mention of affordable attainable housing, um, which I'm really disappointed to see, to, to read. And I'm just wondering, um, Amanda, you've had no doubt conversation with Jay Posner, planning supervisor. Um, and I'm sure the effort was there to negotiate with the developers. Can you shed a little light on what's happened there, Amanda, in terms of, you know, why, why the, uh, why, why little or no, I guess, no attainable affordable housing, uh, secondary dwelling suites, um, was there, what kind, was it obviously there was an effort? Uh, thank you, Mr. Murray. Yes, Jay did speak with the developer and tried to see what he could do as part of this phase when it came to affordable housing. Um, and the developer wasn't comfortable moving forward and, and Jay was, um, under, well, he was working on a 30 year old draft plan. So those conditions aren't there um, from the draft plan with affordable housing. So uh, in some of our subdivisions, we have had luck with the conversation and, and got developers to, to put some in, but on this one, we, we weren't yeah. successful in getting them to commit um, strongly. It's not saying that they won't, uh, the discussions can still carry on for the site plan agreement for the townhouse development and phase three as well. But in this stage, we're not seeing any uh, them coming forward offering. Okay. Okay. Put some in. Mr. Mayor, I, I won't be supporting this recommendation this evening. Um, I'm, um, I'm suggesting that it be deferred back to staff and I'll, and I'll, I'll, and I'll explain why. Um, you know, you made a comment, Mr. Mayor, not long ago that don't, don't bring forth another uh, plan of subdivision that doesn't, doesn't include affordable attainable housing. I agree with you. I agree with you. I think there needs to be more of an effort made uh, with all developers. We look, look at the Devonshire development. 22 secondary dwelling suites, 22 more rental units are being brought in, you know, into the inventory. Uh, Peter Sava development last week, 11 more rental units being brought in the inventory. Um, Snyder contracting, uh, 10, 11 more secondary dwelling suites. Broad Rice, Red Hawk con con contracting, Red Hawk construction. 
the Club of Westlink. 20% of his, of his new apartment dwelling, I think, hopefully coming on board in 2022, 20% CMHC financed, 20% under market rent units. Good for them. I say good for, good for all those developers. And I'm not seeing the same cooperation with this developer, Mr. Mayor. And I don't think we should just, uh, I say, I, I won't be supporting this recommendation. Matter of fact, I, I like to move that we deferred back to staff and, and go back to the developer and say, look, we're, we're all in this thing together. Um, you know, if there's a hundred units being built at this site over the next two, three, four years, can, can the developer not see, see his, her way, his way? Um, to 10 or 12 secondary dwelling suites, for example, given as one example, and bring more rental units um, onto the market. I, I just think we've got a situation here in Saugeen Shore with, I mentioned, I think it was last week that, you know, less than half percent vacancy rate, 0 0.4 vacancy rate for rental units. We've got a problem here in Saugeen Shores. We've, it's an attainable housing, affordable housing situation that we need to work together on. And I don't think it's too much to ask. And so I, I like to defer this back to staff and um, give Jay, you know, allow Jay to, to have further conversation with the developer and let's see what we can come up with. So that I, I'd, I'd be putting a motion on the floor uh, this evening, Mr. Mayor, to defer back to staff. I have a motion to defer. Is there a seconder for the motion? Councilor Grace, second. So we can debate the motion to defer. The deputy mayor was gonna speak next. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and through you, I, along with the Vice Deputy Mayor, have, have a few questions. Um, in looking at the development, and I guess this goes to our director, Amanda, is it normal that we don't have a site plan before we approve? Thank you, through you, Mr. Mayor, that is true. We, um, we have a, a block dedicated to the site plan and they'll come back later under the site plan process to, to uh, work out those details on that block. Okay, I, I really don't like approving until I see it. And it says that we've been given block 44 as dedicated parkland. Well, I don't know if staff has ever even been in this part, but uh, block 44 is landlocked. Most of it is covered by the creek and is on the backyard of, of everybody that is on Peel Street. There's very, very little land that is for parkland development. And I don't know how you'll get to it. As, as I said, it's landlocked. They've moved the stream a little bit. They've played around with it. I, I believe that this is this land is inaccessible. It's not parkland. Uh, I think we should be looking at something else to be be given as dedicated parkland. It says that it is. Uh, um, let's see, 44 and 45 are being jointly designed with trails and park equipment. You have to cross the stream to get to it. So unless they're putting bridges, it's it's beyond my purview or my scope to think of this as even as being parkland. So I will, I agree with the vice deputy mayor. I, I think staff need to look at that to see where, where block 44 actually is. Is it what we require for parkland? Does it meet the needs of our parkland? I don't think so. So I will move, to, I'll follow along and have this motion deferred. Does the director have any comments to any of those issues or the director of community services possibly? Yes, yeah, certainly. Thank you. Um, I can make comment of that. Um, the parks manager and myself did work, did walk the area with the um, with the developer probably about four or five years ago to uh, to determine where would the most applicable spot was for parkland, and it was mutually agreed upon that that would fit the needs. And uh, a design has been um, is in place for that area. So, Mr. Mayor, then it's a question for our director. Yeah. How are you getting to it, Jane? Uh, it, I'd have to go back and look at the plans, but I believe there's a pedestrian um, thoroughfare uh, off no. of McNabb Street. It's been some time, but I can certainly take a look at it because there is a set of plans drawn we for can, that. Uh, we'll get, uh, it looks, uh, well, yeah. we'll see. If we get to, if the deferral happens this evening, then uh, you can get some information, more information on that for the Deputy Mayor, I'm sure. Thank okay. you. Uh, I saw Councillor Grace next, I think. Sorry, Councillor Grace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, uh, uh, support deferring this too. I, I think that we could go back hopefully to the developer and um, also talk about uh, the request for uh, 10 secondary dwelling units, um, not just from an affordable or attainable housing perspective, but also universal design, that this kind of design is really attractive uh, in terms of, um, you know, providing um, a, uh, a unit for maybe an older relative who 
uh, would like to live with the rest of the family or um, maybe a caregiver if somebody in the future needs um, needs a, a live-in caretaker or nanny or whatever. Uh, I mean, I think there are a lot of reasons why that design is is attractive. And so maybe that, I, I mean, one of the things that we talked about in our universal design um, presentation for developers through the accessibility committee is that this can be a, a real selling feature if it's presented correctly. And um, maybe um, the developer uh, could review that presentation that um, Minnie Jakes and I pre uh, prepared and that might help um, make a change of heart here. Thanks. Thank you. Are there further uh, comments from members? Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with the motion to defer. I don't see, given all the talk that we have had and all the things that we have done, all the successes we have had, I don't see how I could put my signature on a on a subdivision agreement that included no opportunity for rental or no opportunity for affordable options for housing. Uh, we've had great success, as the Vice Deputy Mayor rightly pointed out, with several developers in getting secondary suites in our older subdivisions that had, you know, that were working their way through the pipeline with plans of subdivision that had previously been approved. We had developers who didn't have to uh, step up to the plate. Uh, in this case, we, you know, we don't have an agreement yet, and I don't think we have to sign one until uh, we get some affordable housing uh, options here. It's, we're not, I tell you this, our future subdivisions where they come with plans of subdivision aren't gonna get away with just a few secondary suites. They're gonna have to build apartments. Uh, uh, I mean, that's certainly my expectation. <laughs> uh, we're not, you know, so this is a pretty easy thing to do, these few secondary suites, it's pretty low impact. And in fact, as uh, Councilor Grace rightly points out, it's probably a selling feature for the subdivision. And, and could be and that could be more profitable for the developer. And we want our developers to have more profitable subdivisions while they build affordable housing. They can do that, it's workable, and this developer can do the same. So uh, I'm completely in favor of deferring, uh, send this back to this developer and, uh, and tell them the town of Sogging Shores needs an agreement, uh, needs you to sign on the dotted line for these 10 additional secondary suites. Um, you have trouble getting my vote if he doesn't do that. Are there further comments, uh, Councillor, or pardon me, the Deputy Mayor? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, one last comment. Um, as our Director Amanda just, uh, mentioned previously, this is a thir over 30-year-old agreement and plan. I like to see any plans that come forward that are, you know, even 10 years old to be modernized because what was applicable 30 years ago does not ne meet our needs today. Yeah, I mean, we're subject to certain obligations and, and, and you know, um, there's a continuum here and we're, you know, uh, and we have to respect that. But I think, uh, you know, every time there's a new decision to be made, every time there's a new agreement to be signed, uh, you know, we get a new opportunity to, um, to ask for certain things. And uh, this is a crisis and every developer needs to help us address it. Uh, and it's not, it cannot be optional. It certainly isn't optional with me. And I think I'm pretty sure all of you feel the same way. So, um, so anyway, that's where I'm at. We have a motion to defer. It's been moved and seconded. I'll ask all in favor. That's carried. All right, that moves us then on to uh, community services, parks and recreation reports. And the first one is a staff report on phase two, Lamont Sports Park and the director. Thank you. And through you, as phase one progresses of the Lamont Sports Park, it's clear to see that the park will quickly become one of the best ball facilities within the region. As future phases are planned for, there are several elements that need to be considered to ensure adequate funds are included to guarantee the same level of excellence is continued throughout those phases. Staff supports the recommendation presented by the fundraising committee and additionally identifies the need for a storage compound to house supplies and equipment to keep out of the elements and prolong their, life sp their lifespans, as well as added earthworks and landscaping to finish off the two future diamonds. Although it was hoped that the remaining on-site fill could have been used for the completion of phase two, areas outside of the previously surveyed area that house the access road have areas that require additional fill for stability purposes. The total amount of fill required for future phases is yet to be completely determined. Staff is also recommending that a 15 to 20% be included for project consultant or prime consultation as part of the overall, um, overall cost. If the diamonds are construct constructed in 2023, play could be anticipated by 2025. 
Thank you. Thank you. We have a recommendation. I'll read it. We take questions or comments. It's recommended that council approve the phase two recommendations for Lamont Sports Park to be included in the terms of reference for the Lamont Sports Park Fundraising Committee. The Deputy Mayor and then Councilor Schreiber. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just want to start by saying I totally agree with our director. This will be one of the premier ball facilities in the area. What I do not agree with, however, is the restrooms being part of the fundraising committee. Restrooms are municipalities responsibilities and before we open up I'd like to see two complete washroom facilities put at the new facility in the same line that we put in at Lakeview the the modular uh, buildings I think they are far superior to to building a brick and mortar uh, facility um, and I do believe that is the town's responsibility not the fundraising community's responsibility to put in washrooms Okay. Did the, maybe to the director, just to clarify that, did the fundraising committee in their presentation to us recommend that they raise funds for the washroom facility? Uh, no, I don't believe they did for the washrooms directly. There was um, uh, identified items that were um, recommended for the fundraising and then those that were identified through the municipality. Okay. All right. Uh, Councilor Shrine. Thank you, and through you, um, thank you, Jane, for uh, and and on behalf of the um, fundraising strategy committee and and hopefully the the future fundraising committee, uh, which I'm very happy to sit on. Uh, you know, thank you for the support uh, of of phase two and and what the community, what the community group and the user groups feel is is the is the uh, the right next amenities that we need to build out at, at this great park. I'm looking forward to the. Uh, tour tomorrow night. Um, at our presentation um, that this that the um, fundraising strategy committee developed, I think we identified the. I'm just going to look it up quickly. I think we identified the um, snack bar restroom area as combination funding, which would be both through the capital program and fundraising. Um, the reason that um, that was included in with that is that we looked at amenities that would be attractive for people to. Uh, sponsor or fundraise for perhaps some local builders that we would have successes at. If the town staff um, and, and other members of council want to see a different approach to that, I think that um, I think that the fundraising strategy committee would be happy to get support to raise one million dollars um, and and kind of stay in line with what we what we laid out. But I think that there is some wiggle room there for if staff feel that um, we could go a different direction in with regards to the the restrooms. Sorry, and one more follow-up question, if I may. Um, Jane, when will you or when will staff or the contractor know about the additional required fill for the laneway in and perhaps the surrounding the, the next two diamonds? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I'm hoping within the next couple of weeks, they're bringing some engineers to take a look at it. It's a little bit... Uh, more wet in that area than the rest of the area and quite a bit of clay. So obviously we want to ensure that we complete that access road in a condition that we don't have to go back and repair it on a regular basis. Okay. Further questions or comments? The Vice Deputy Mayor. Well, thanks, Mr. Mayor. And uh, I, I, you know, and I, the, the, the fundraising strategy committee, I know there was discussion about the washroom facility and I, you know, having listened to our deputy mayor this evening, I tend to agree with uh, our deputy mayor that, you know, I'm not convinced maybe now that, that the fundraising committee um, should have the responsibility of fundraising for a washing facility. I think their focus really should be centered around that $700,000 for the two additional diamonds and perhaps a few other amenities. But I, I tend to agree with our deputy mayor on that one. I well, I'm not sure that's the responsibility of the fundraising committee to do that. So I wonder if staff could take that into consideration, Mr. Mayor. Okay. I mean, I mean frankly, it will really be the striking committee taking it under consideration. We're going to have to draft the terms of reference uh, to come back uh, to council, and it's going to include the projects and the funding. Uh, so just to be clear on the process, I suppose, are there further uh, questions or comments from members? I think, and if I'm re remembering correctly, sorry, Michael, come back. Yeah, I, I just um, um, the so the fundraising uh, committee recommended uh, or said that they could um, raise a million dollars and and suggested that the municipality contribute 1.25 million 
to the identified projects, correct? So it's really a dollar from the fundraising committee for a dollar 25 from the municipality, um, which is a pretty good ratio as far as I'm concerned. I'm pretty happy with that. The fundraising committee can come up with a buck. I think we can come up with a buck 25, but I, um, uh, but of course that was to get to two, two and a quarter. Um, and the low estimate here is 2.7. Now, if you would take the, if you take the lot, the snack bar out, you might get in at two, but my guess is the way things are going, those high recommendations are probably more where you're going to end up on construction costs than low. It just seemed to me plus two years out plus, plus, plus. Um, so, um, so I'm content at the ratio one to 125. Um, and, uh, but recognizing that you're probably not going to build all this stuff for two and a quarter, for two and a quarter million. Um, so, um, so I think we're going to have to, I, I guess all I'm saying is we're going to have to, the striking committee and council are going to have to figure that in as we, as we structure this terms of reference and as we lay out exactly what the municipality will contribute to what projects and how many projects we think can actually be undertaken for our, for our $2.25 million. Um, so it may not, it may be that all of this cannot be included uh, at that price, at that, at that level of funding. Um, so I think that that's, uh, I mean, it's I just important note to, to recognize, I guess. And uh, I think it's something, fair warning to council, it's something the striking committee is going to have to consider uh, as we, as we think about how to come back with this and how, which of these projects to put in and at what funding level. I, but it's very important that we're super clear about that in the terms of reference so that the fundraising committee can have absolute confidence that what they're raising money for is going to get built and that council was going to come up with the money if they raise their if they raise the money and that if the fundraising committee you know we are, we're hopeful the fundraising committee will raise a million and we'll come up with our million two five but if they raise you know 500 then our number is closer to 600 right so and that'll build what it builds i guess so i think um this is all just to sort of run down the considerations we're going to have to make uh, as a striking committee and as council as we finalize these terms of reference so that we're clear uh, clarity is kindness and we want to be we want to have a great relationship with this fundraising committee we want them to be super successful and we want and when they come back we want it to be a celebration and not a fight so so let's get it right right now two comments um, the vice deputy mayor sorry Mike. yeah i think mr mayor and i i, I you know i Jane's put in a three hundred thousand dollars earthworks landscaping, and I, you know, I checked back in some of my notes from from uh, two or three years back for the police services building, and and council's aware of this or not, but you know they they trucked two to three hundred thousand dollars worth of fill out of Lamont Sports Park to lower the cost of the police building. So, I you know I, I think it's really unfair, you know, to to pass that cost on to. Lamont Sports Park. I mean, it's it's probably one pocket for another. I'm just saying, that, you know, there's a there's an expense there that it's been been shifted around here a little bit. So that's 300 grand. I'm not real content with. But the other the other thing, Mr. Mayor, is I, I I guess the recommendation where it says approve phase two recommendations to be included in the terms of reference. Um, I I don't necessarily you know agree with the. The seven hundred thousand dollars for restroom snack bar to be included as part of the fundraising mandate for the fundraising committee. So, if we approve this recommendation this evening, I guess I need clarification here. What does this mean? I think I would like some clarity from council. If you want that snack bar restroom removed, then I would get, I would like to get that direction for the striking committee so that okay. we know not to bring it back. Uh, Councillor Schreiber. Uh, thank you. And through you, and, and perhaps I appreciate um, Mike's question as well, um, looking for some clarification, but also um, the strategy committee um, was asked to bring forward a strategy with the amenities that we felt um, were best suited for phase two. And I think that we met that mandate. The additional staff recommendation, recommendations, which I'm not saying that I disagree with, um, that drives the price up. And, and so those additional costs, which I can appreciate and, and respect the comments, um, Mr. Mayor, that you made about um, perhaps it, it'll be closer to the 300, you know, or the 3 million mark or 3.7 mark, which is the high end here. Um, 
but those aren't amenities in the park that we planned on fundraising for or contributing funds towards in the fundraising program. So if, if that could be taken into consideration as well, perhaps with the recommendation. Yeah, I mean, I think that like the machinery storage compound certainly wasn't in there and I can see that uh, being more of a municipal responsibility. The earthworks and landscaping, you know, what we have to do is make sure that what we're targeting here is what something we can actually do, right? And the earthworks and landscaping are probably may well be required as part of to get the to get the things done that the com fundraising committee are recommending, we're going to have to do. Uh, and so, um, so that's part of the cost. And, um, you know, I understand the vice deputy mayor's point, but it's important, never important, important to remember that we've already spent five and a half million dollars on Lamont Sports Park of taxpayers dollars. So I think we've soaked up the 300 grand that we gave the police building and then some, I mean, uh, to go forward with this and you, and you, we're going to have a, we're going to have a, uh, another report later tonight, our asset management plan, which shows what we have with the other things we have to do, you know, to go forward with this, we're going to need this fundraising. As I said before, it has to get, we, that's what we need to get it done. I can come up with a dollar 25 to one, but I, I can't come up with hundred percent of this 3.7 million. I just like, just not going to get my vote if I'm around to vote for it. But the, but, but the, uh, so we need the fundraising to move it forward. And we, and then, so we, so we're on the right track with that, but we need to be realistic about the costs because you see what, you know, what happens, right? You, you get to the point, you get to the end point and say, oh man, the costs are inflated three times. And we only raised, you know, <laughs> the, the ratios don't work anymore. Now we can't build it and everybody's angry. So we need to do really good work right now of estimating these costs. The director's built in a buffer of three, $400,000 there, Earthworks Landscaping. I think we're probably gonna need that buffer in fairness. And so, uh, so I think, but I could see, you know, I could see the machinery storage compound being sort of outside the context of this uh, business. And I could support not bringing that forward, but, um, so we can, you know, there's some room to play with the numbers. It would be good to get some direction from council. You got the snack bar, restrooms, machinery, storage compound. If we can get some direction on that here tonight. Maybe the striking committee can fill in the rest of the blanks. Mr. Mayor, I, Mr. Mayor I, like I heard our vice deputy mayor say, and I'm agreeing with him. I, I don't believe the $700,000 for restrooms, um, snack bars should be as part of the fundraising campaign. Um, uh, you know, if you look at the, you look at the Lakeview uh, ball diamond, the new washing facility that was put in there. It's a very, very attractive, very well done washing facility. And Jane can help me uh, figure out the number here, but I thought it was $150,000. I don't know whether it was 200, Jane. Maybe you could wait in. What was the cost for that washing facility at the uh, tourist camp? It's just under 150,000. Just under 150,000. I, you know, I'm not convinced we need to spend $700,000 in a washing facility. I, I like to keep that number $1 million. That's what our fundraising committee, uh, Council Schreider, that's what our committee said that they're willing to, to raise. And, and I, I, I like to see that rest that 700. I mean, I, I would have no problem maybe trying to fundraise for a bit, a portion perhaps for the snack bar, maybe, but not the washing facility. So sure. I think that I think, number, yeah. anyways, sorry, that's sorry for interrupting. I think uh, in fairness to the director, I think she's drawn that number from the plan uh, that we had, which showed a pretty elaborate structure uh, for that facility, uh, which as I recall, did come in around the half million or million dollar mark uh, in the estimates. So that's likely where we come from. Uh, we'll get Councillor Mayette and then I'm gonna try to wrap this up. Councillor Mayette. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I wasn't going to weigh in on this, but when I did look at those numbers, I'm trying to imagine uh, what kind of a fancy machinery storage that we're going to build for between $150,000 and $500,000. And I know construction costs have gone up, but uh, I know like a, a nice drive shed. You can buy a pretty nice 30 by 60 drive shed for under $100,000 anytime in Soggy and Shores. I mean, we're talking about a, a shed to be able to drive the lawnmowers in, right? We're not talking about an office building, right? It looks like we're talking about a compound and not a shed. Uh, so it may be more elaborate than that. The director, do you have any comments? Yeah, thank you for your question. And it is a compound. We're looking at an area that potentially could be fenced off from the other, from the ball diamond facility, uh, a space where staff would be. Uh, we're going to need a spot for potentially um, Wi-Fi enhancements down there because that'll be the next request that we have. A coverall potentially there where we can put our tractors down there. And it will be an area that is staffed each evening when ball, ball games are on, unlike our other ball fields right now. 
Okay, so for the purposes of the uh, of tonight and and direction to, uh, that we're going to offer back to the striking committee, uh, can, is there consensus that we ought to remove the uh, restrooms and the machinery storage compound from the fundraising uh, from the mandate for the fundraising strategy committee? Do you want, is there any disagreement with that? I don't hear any. So. Um, uh, we can consider, Linda, we can consider then that uh, that um, we're approving phase two, these phase two recommendations minus the restrooms and the machinery storage compound. Um, and I guess we'll consider, I'm not gonna try to redraft the recommendation, but we'll just consider it as amended. Is that clear to everybody? Okay, so I've read it, it has been amended, all in favor. That's carried. Okay, then that moves us on to uh, the second one, which is a staff report on an exemption to the municipal alcohol policy for Curlon Tankard Championship and the director. Uh, thank you, and through you, I really don't have much more to add to this report. I think the recommendation is pretty self-explanatory. We've been working closely with the Tankard Planning Committee and um, it's been great relationships moving forward and we're looking forward to this event at the Plex. Thank you. There's a recommendation that council grant a one-time exemption to the municipal alcohol policy to permit alcohol to be consumed in the community complex tiered seating and front lobby for the 2022 Curlon Tankard Championship, February 6th to 13th, 2022. Questions or comments? Start with the deputy mayor and then come to council mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I hope I'm not stealing councilor Maya's thunder because we've both been asking about the same thing. Um, Jane, we've mentioned this before. Have, are we now ready to look at a new policy for alcohol in the facility? Uh, many of our surrounding um, municipalities have a different alcohol uh, policy where we, the town municipality, looks after the uh, sale and collection of funds to limit and monitor the amount of alcohol that is used in the building. Also for large events such as say winter hawk games or if we have other events in the facility are we now going to be able to look at extending the alcohol from the from not the green room sorry from the rotary hall out into the stands or is uh, this a one-time thing thank you for your question and, and through you mr mayor uh this report is strictly dealing with the tankard event at this point um we, along with many of our surrounding communities, follow the municipal alcohol, pol alcohol policy outlined by public health. There, you are right. There are a couple of communities out there that have adopted a broader um, policy in their facilities. At this point, we're simply looking at the Tankard event. What I'm asking is, are now we going to are we now going to be open to looking and amending our policy because there are many other events where this could be occurring? Uh, I don't think we're in a position to make that commitment at this time. Okay. okay. Uh, Council Maya. Um, John, our Deputy Mayor, you were right. You, uh, you're, I agree with everything you said. And I think I am in a position at this time to amend that policy. And I would like to see staff take this back and come up with a policy that can be applied whenever we have a large event, be it, you know, as, as the Deputy Mayor said, Winter Hawks games, um, you know, more and more, we're going to see, uh, we're going to be attracting larger events. Let's uh, let's write this up once and for all, and, and be able to uh, hit certain criteria that uh, triggers being able to serve alcohol other than in the room upstairs. Okay. Thank you. Further uh, comments from members. I um, I mean I agree with the deputy mayor and council Mayan. I mean I think we need to uh, get this policy amended. I think uh, it. I think. Uh, the director has lots of things going on and so i don't think it needs to be a uh, a return immediately i don't think that's re reasonable for council to expect but i do think uh, it would be good to review this policy and for you to work that into your work schedule as it, as as you're able because i think uh, i do agree that you know we're the times they are changing and i think we could be into a situation where you know, where we could permit uh, uh, alcohol to be consumed more along these lines in accordance with AGCO policies and uh, and the rules of uh, of the other rules that pertain to that. So, um, so I think it's a good note, and, and hopefully something staff will take back and and action as they are able to. But uh, for the time being, we're looking at this resolution, and if the recommendations work, and if there's nothing 
uh, further on it, then all in favor. That's carried. Thank you. All right, so that moves us through to reports of councilors and I, I have a report there and it's uh, largely for your information, but I will draw your attention to uh, the paragraph in there on the municipal state of emergency um, to advise you and the public uh, that uh, it is, uh, well, first to note that, uh, the, that the, the emergency has been declared since uh, the 24th of March, 2020. And it was declared by me uh, under the authority of head of council under the Emergency Management and Civil Protection Act under that act, um, either the head of council or the, or council uh, can rescind a municipal uh, declaration of emergency. Um, given the current situation, uh, I am uh, uh, of the view that it's time for that emergency declaration to be reviewed by council uh, to determine whether it ought to continue. Um, and, uh, and so I'm going to bring the, the declaration to council on the 13th of September uh, for council to uh, review and determine if it should be extended or terminated at that time. And if there's nothing on that, then uh, council Griggs, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. My question's not about uh, the municipal emergency issue, but um, I did have uh, a question about the, you drew to our attention and included a link to the um, transportation master plan for the county. Um, and I don't know if you can answer this uh, right now, but I noticed um, uh, with interest in, in the report that um, it said that the county uh, is going to be working with the MTO to plan for improvements, including Highway 21 from Port Elgin to Southampton, other areas in Highway 21 that go through our municipality. But I wondered if the um, date range that was mentioned in the report from 2031 to 2035 applies just to the um, uh, planned improvements for county roads or if it, if it applies to Highway 21 stretches as well. And thanks, I appreciate you uh, sending me that question in advance because it gave me the opportunity to uh, pass it along to the Director of uh, Transportation at the county who did respond to me and let me know that uh, uh, so the commitment in terms of timeline applies really only to the county's roads. Uh, they have not received any commitments from the MTO uh, about timelines for any of this work, which isn't really surprising. But I think what the uh, um, transportation plan lays out and uh, attempts to make clear is that the county intends to advocate with the MTO for these improvements or changes that have been suggested on the MTO's roads. And uh, um, so it's a it's really more a question of advocacy than uh, than being able to hold the MTO to any particular commitment. Well, I'm glad to see the county um, stepping forward for advocacy, and particularly I know the the rail trail crossing across 21, uh, which is of great concern and has been for a number of years uh, and continues to be. Um, I was also really pleased to see the um, um, information about initiating discuss discussions um, with various partners for um, extending transit options for the public. Um, so that was that was encouraging. Thank yeah. you. There's a great deal of interest at the county council uh, and across the county in transit. We had a good presentation from Gray County's uh, transit uh, organization uh, at our last transportation meeting. And I think there's good opportunities to work with them to uh, provide linkages into Gray County and across Bruce County. I know there's a lot of interest. I've heard from several people in Saugeen Shores who would love to see those linkages that come through Wyerton and uh, Sobel Beach come down into Southampton and Port Elgin. And uh, I certainly agree with that. So I think we're having those conversations and working on that. And I think, uh, uh, and this transportation plan makes it a priority. And so I'm, so I'm very hopeful that we're gonna be able to get some regional transit in Bruce County uh, before too long. Uh, the Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And along the lines of Councillor Grace there, I wonder if you'd be able to push um, the county to be as forward thinking as Sogging Shores is. And as they're redoing the roads, instead of leaving them gravel to start paving the shoulders as places like Meaford Thornbury do, uh, the tourism aspect, the active transportation routes could be greatly enhanced. And I know it, it's something that many People who aren't cyclists or active transportation people don't really care about, but you must look at, at the needs of, of what it will do to the area. Um, 
we had a report from former head of uh, recreation, now CAO of Thornbury, Sean Everett, of how they have done every side road. They put a paved shoulder on it and it brings a thousand pe over a thousand people a weekend to the area. Imagine Bruce County having those, those paved shoulders and what it could do for our transportation, our active transportation and, and the tourism aspect. Yeah, and I, and I can assure you, uh, Deputy Mayor, that, the, that active transportation is a significant part of the transportation master plan and, uh, and it's uh, uh, creating those linkages and encouraging that kind of activity is certainly a, a strong priority for the county and uh, certainly something that I and other members of county council will continue to encourage. Are there other uh, questions about my report before we move on? I don't see any, so we will move on and we'll go to uh, item nine, reports of department heads. And uh, the first one is information report on the 2020 asset management plan. And we will get the director of infrastructure and development. Oh no, sorry, we'll get Jessica Rogers, the asset management coordinator. My apologies, Jessica. Uh, thank you and through you, Mr. Mayor. Um... The Asset Management Plan, or AMP, has been developed as a tool to assist in the decision-making process surrounding the town's assets. It is based on, yeah, it's on now, <laughs> sorry. Um, it's based on industry standards and best practices and incorporates the data we have available at the time the data is compiled. At this time, the document will be covering only core assets owned by the municipality, with the understanding that additional assets will be reviewed and incorporated in the next iteration of the report. Core assets at this time um, include the transportation network, as well as water, storm, and sanitary systems. The AMP has relied on two um, data sources to determine replacement costs for our, our assets. Costing has been determined from either user-defined costs or cost of inflation. Uh, calculations. User-defined cost estimates um, come from town staff and are based on recent contracts, engineering reports, and assessments. Cost inflation, on the other hand, um, is calculated using the consumer price index. The condition data available for the core infrastructure assets in this AMP are primarily age-based unless observed data is available. Although age-based data is less accurate, it provides a baseline that will allow for long-term capital funding um, and planning. When assessed condition data is not available, age-based condition has been determined using the Canadian Infrastructure Report Card template. Age-based condition assessments are calculated based on deterioration percentages and current age of the asset. This is modeled and applied to the assets in the GIS. Uh, core infrastructure classes in the town had a total valuation of $397 million as of 2019, and that works out to approximately $29,000 per capita based on the 2016 census population. For the core assets, 76% fall within the category of good to very good condition. This translates to over $303 million of current core assets falling within this category, leaving approximately 93 million or 24% of the town of Sogging Shores assets falling below good condition. Although in many cases a deficit is seen, it is important to understand that this means um, what this means at the root of it. In this case, a deficit explains that we have a dollar value of assets that are either in poor condition or have reached end of life. As a result, these assets will require either rehabilitation or replacement in the near future. The next step for many of these assets that fall into this category is to complete more in-depth condition assessments and develop a program on how to deal with these assets. Once again, I would like to remind you that the asset management plan should be considered one tool in our belt when it comes to managing our assets and planning our future. As we continue to improve our data resources, including expanding our data software through um, software programs like CityWorks and the addition of Asset Optimizer, these values will begin to show truer, truer to the ground picture of our asset performance. Work order and maintenance history, as well as condition assessments will also allow us to become more precise in our planning. It is important to understand that this is the starting point for us as we build our asset management knowledge and data. In many cases, we rely on industry standards when we don't have better information, which allows us to forecast the best we can with the information we have. This report shows a high level summary of our core infrastructure assets and is the starting point for how we can measure the improvement or decline 
on our annual investment into asset rehabilitation. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. I will turn it over to members of the committee for questions or comments. Start with the deputy mayor. And then Council Green. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, thank you for the report, Jessica. Seven years ago, when I first joined Council, we went to our training sessions, and two things were drilled into us: water. We must maintain our, our, our water system. That's the the first job and role of council. And the second was asset management plans. In order to be able to be eligible for funding throughout the province and federally, you have to have a strong asset management plan. At our first visioning session, we were told we were in the process of developing this asset management plan because at that time it had to be completed by 2022. So five years after our time when we began. Um, my question is, and where, why are we behind? If we were told back seven years ago that our asset management plan had to be completed in five years, I'm now looking at, we're looking at another four years past this time for our asset management plan to be completed and fulfilled. So I know Jessica, you're, you're just new in the last year or so, and I appreciate all the work you've done and, and this isn't on you, but why are we be, so behind when we were supposed to be moving towards this um, a long time ago. Yeah, uh, thank you and through you. Um, so I think part of it is that we're trying to um, meet the OREG um, regulations that have been put forward. So they've kind of come up with this timeline that breaks down the asset management into um, probably more uh, manageable pieces. And a big portion of this, and I think what takes the most time and from speaking to other municipalities, um, and other towns and cities is the data and the information. And the fact that um, it actually states that a lot of the data and information can't be older than two years old. So, um, you know, the, the regulation will state that um, studies and condition assessments can only be two years old. So you're kind of, you're working uh, kind of against that timeline as well. Um, and again, it comes down to data and I think um, staffing as well. And, and the fact that a lot of asset management is done kind of side of side of desk. And that's what I've heard kind of through and through from multiple people. So just to follow up to that. Um, so Jessica, can you tell me where are we at in assessing all of our assets? Are we at 50%, 70%? Whereabouts? Well, so a lot of, so let me start with this. So some of our core assets, so certain things like um, our roads were mandated. We have to do assessments. Um, same with bridges. Um, we run into problems when we start looking at buried infrastructure and assessing them because it's obviously a lot more difficult. Um, and then the, the financial component of actually getting um, proper assessments done for those. So that's why a lot of this information is age-based um, still. And then as we move forward and we start looking at things like facilities, um, those are ones that we, we still haven't assessed at this point. Really? Well, thank you for all the hard work that you're doing on that. And please keep it up and, and keep reporting to council because as I said, the, one of the two things that were drilled into us is asset management. And we know that we're sometimes not successful in some of our grant applications and it may go back to our, our asset management plan. Yeah. Maybe, Thank you. Could we just clarify uh, and follow up to the deputy mayor's question? Is the town stocking chores meeting its statutory obligations for asset management under the Ontario regulation? Yes, we are. So um, due to COVID, they've actually put out an amendment to it and have pushed the date by a year. So originally, this report would have been due July 1st um, of this year, and they've pushed it by a year. So technically, this um, in asset management portion of um, our plan is not due until July 1st, 2022. However, um, I felt like we should still move forward at this point, especially because that would mean um, we would have to update a lot of our data. That's good. So we're actually ahead of the ahead of schedule on the provincial yeah. timeline. And uh, and that should certainly meet the province's expectations, therefore, when it comes to funding uh, yes. and projects. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, Council Grace. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Jessica. This is such an important report. And uh, I, I really, um, you know, the <laughs> conclusions that you had about us developing a long-term financial strategy. We heard earlier in the evening about how 
solid our finances are, and that's wonderful. But at the same time, this report says that we have a $5.4 million annual deficit um, in terms of, um, you know, keeping up with, with uh, modernizing, uh, uh, bringing our assets uh, that are near the end of their lives to uh, back to their functioning uh, ability. Um, and that we should be implementing a funding strategy uh, to try to um, narrow that, that deficit or decrease that deficit. There was one section in the road report that I did write to you about, but I just wondered if you could, I, I just thought maybe a member of the public looking at this um, maybe might be a little confused because I found, I found um, when I was reading, it was sort of a discrepancy. Um, initially, uh, the statement in the road said that 81% of all road assets have five years or less of useful life remaining, and 53% have useful life that is expired. Um, but then uh, farther down in the, the report, it says that um, uh, the um, majority of our road assets were rated in the very good category, 69%, and only 10% fall between fair, fair to very poor condition. And I, I know that those are different measurements, but you sent back a, a clear explanation to me. I wonder if you could just talk about, about that, please. Yeah. Yes, uh, through you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, so the, the key piece to understand with this is... Um, basically how useful life is, is calculated. So we take install year um, and then an estimated useful life that's given through, um, you know, various engineering reports, um, other, you know, industry standards, um, and we apply that. So for example, for our roads, um, the useful life of a road, I'm just, I want to make sure I get the right number here. Um, is around 15 years. And that's that's based on our team here um, and what they know in terms of how quickly our roads deteriorate and, and whatnot. So when we say things are past useful life, that means that they're past that 15 year threshold. Um, however, where you see that discrepancy um, or the confusion in terms of the condition is that we are continuing to um, maintain or repair those roads to keep the standard of that road um, at the highest level that we possibly can. So, and I think that's probably where maybe a little bit of the um, confusion throughout the report is, is, is when I speak to a deficit, what this deficit is speaking about is that this asset is either, either reached end of useful life or is in poor condition. Um, it's not necessarily meaning that if an asset's at the end of useful life, that it's in poor condition and needs immediate attention. However, it is an asset that will down the line, probably sooner than later, need rehabilitation or um, a complete um, overhaul of that asset. Um, so hopefully that clears that up for you. It was helpful for me. Okay. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Okay, uh, further questions or comments from members of the committee? I think, uh, and it uh, goes back a few years further than uh, the deputy mayor, but when I first came on council, there was uh, the work at that time was going uh, to um, starting to account for the depreciation of our assets, uh, was something, which was something municipalities hadn't done before that time. And, uh, and a big effort began at that time to try to quantify the value of all the municipalities assets. And as Jessica pointed out, that was easy for some things and more difficult for things that you can't see or that have, you may not even know are there. Um, the important thing to remember is that we've only really been working at much of this for the last 15 or 16 years, uh, but the municipalities have existed for 130 years. Uh, and there's an awful lot of assets that have been constructed. And you can see in this report, some are 50, 60 years old. Uh, and it's pretty hard to find them all, quantify them when no rec when a lot of records weren't being kept very well, and 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 many of them were on paper, and many of them are lost. Uh, it's a very it's a it's a, it's a it's easy now for new things we're building now because we've GIS them and we've put them into uh, programs and we can monitor them and track them. But 
things that are 60, 70 years old, much more difficult, particularly buried infrastructure. So the work that Jessica and, and folks like her are doing is really important work for the municipalities, but it's really hard work and it's going and it takes a long time. Uh, and build and but slowly over time we build up a better sense of what we own and how to manage it and what it costs and what its replacement costs will be and that'll help us to plan better. Um, and certainly this is um, a place to start. I, I think it is, you know, as Council Council Grace pointed out, there's some uh, difficulty quantifying what uh, the right, what the right measurement is to use to where you decide to replace some of these things. Uh, just like your house, you know, you may live in an old house, but if you keep it maintained, you can live in it forever, right? And that's the case with roads and bridges too, to an extent. So, um, so it's hard to use length of life as a hard line to say we're not. This is the date you have to replace it. So there's some nuance and some, and and there's some decision making by council to put in there to to. to and by staff to prioritize things, but it's a good place to start and it's important work. And uh, so Jessica, we much appreciate all of your efforts and uh, look forward to your continuing efforts. We need you to keep working. So keep working, please. And thank you for your work. Thank you. All right. Uh, so that moves on from that report and on to the second report, which is an information report project update for Cedar Crescent Village. And uh, I assume that the Director of Protective Services, yes, he does, the Director of Protective Services. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The, the information report before you um, serves as an update to Council uh, with regards to the application process. Uh, council is very aware that our staff have been working with the SVCA for many months now to uh, seek approval. And this approval process has stalled the, uh, the final design and, and, and the project at, at this point. Um, the, the report serves as an update to Council to let you know that we've requested a, an executive committee hearing to, um, to move the, the, uh, the, the approval process ahead. Um, and uh, we happy to answer any, any questions regarding the, the status of the, the project or the, or the application. Thanks, I might just make a couple of comments just off the top on this one. Uh, so for some clarification, uh, based on some comments I'm hearing from members of the public, first, it's important for folks to remember uh, the town of Sogging Shores began consulting with the Conservation Authority about uh, building anything on this piece of property before the CCB was even proposed and before we put out an RFP to replace what was already there back in 2019. Uh, and at that time, uh, we heard, though not a, an approval, but uh, certainly some positive indication from the authority that yes, development would be possible in that location. And that was the basis on which we proceeded uh, to, through the RFP, through the approval of the CCB pro project uh, and uh, the signing of that lease agreement. Uh, and so um, uh, we have uh, as we've submitted an application to the Conservation Authority on the 2nd of February, about uh, seven, almost seven months ago, uh, seven months ago, yes. and uh, um, no decision has been rendered by the authority to date. Um, I've heard some buzz about there about that folks suggesting that the permit has been uh, denied or uh, refused by SBCA staff. That is not the case. Uh, there has just been no no action in terms of deciding on this file. Um, and that is leading to delays, uh, which are uh, you know, problematic but delays of that length of time are a real issue. So um, for any project. And so the Town of Sergeant Chores has uh, uh, asked uh, the authorities executive committee to hold a hearing to um, I decide that the file is complete, the application is complete, and to uh, approve the file, uh, approve the, the permit uh, so that we can move forward with the next steps in this process. So um, this is a very routine thing. I was in, I, when I was chairman of the authority and a member of the executive committee, I've participated in several uh, executive committee uh, section 28 hearings. Uh, it's uh, pretty standard uh, and often the case for more complex projects. Uh, uh, particularly ones with that staff at the SBCA are having trouble advancing for one reason or another. Uh, and so, um, so, uh, so it's something that they can do and, and uh, we're uh, hopeful that the authority will schedule that hearing in short order and render a decision on this file uh, so we know the answer. I think just like any applicant um, for any permit, um, we deserve a timely response. Uh, and uh, and we hope that the authority agrees that we deserve a timely response and will act uh, accordingly. So, um, so I just wanted to add that little bit of context and uh, there may be questions or comments from other members, are there? I'd like to accept the 
Oh, well, just yeah, just I'm not gonna, thank you for your comments, Mr. Mayor and Councillor Grace, and I, of course, are uh, the board members with Saugeen Valley Conservation Authority, and uh, just echo your words: seven months is too long. Um, typical permit uh, may take four weeks uh, to, to to a month, uh, two months to maybe to three months, but seven months is is not uh, is is not real fair in my view. And and, and Councillor Grace and I have have indicated that to the board that uh, just, just make a decision. And the, and I have heard the same comments from members of the public that uh, decision has been made. No, it hasn't been made. Um, we we want. The board, uh, you know, we want the SPCA staff to make a decision. So I just, I'm just echoing your words. I, you framed it really well, and I, we, we are, Councilor Grace and I are trying at our end too to move this process along. But it uh, is taking, it's taking, in our view, too long. So, but um, hopefully, uh, something will happen in the next, in the next month or so. <laughs> okay, yeah, Councilor Grace, I guess how you're in. Um, yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just to. Um... To add uh, something else, um, some correspondence that um, I received, I think maybe all members of council did, but um, suggested that uh, perhaps um, the, um, that this was an unusual, um, a request to um, have the authority move along on making a decision, either issuing a permit or not, or moving the process along. Um, as a member of the board, I have been asked and have made a number of inquiries on behalf of um, residents in my constituency who wondered at the status of an application. And so I would contact the director or perhaps the um, regulations officer in charge of the file and just inquire about um, you know, what the delay is and is there any way that this could be um, expedited based on practical uh, considerations that, that, that those property owners might have in terms of, um, you know, having a, a, a contractor lined up to work. So it's, it's something that that kind of inquiry, uh, in my experience, is, is something that I've done a, a, a number of times. Thanks. Thank you. Are there further questions or comments from members? I don't see any, so we'll... Uh... Hope for a response from the Conservation Authority, and, uh, and certainly I'm sure the director and uh, his colleagues will keep us up to date on progress on the file. Thank you, Phil. All right, so that uh, moves us through to the end of Committee of the Whole, and that moves on to statements by members. I'm going to deviate from tradition uh, this evening and call on Councillor Rich first. Councillor Rich. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, it's nice to be able to have a chance to speak first. Usually, uh, Deputy Mayor Matheson always steals my thunder, so it's a, it's a great opportunity for me. Um, good evening, uh, Mayor and uh, fellow count, members of council, members of staff, and members of the public. After careful consideration for personal reasons, I will be forced to resign from my position as Southampton Ward Council, um, effective September 7th, 2021. I've spoken with Linda White, the town clerk, and put in motion all the necessary steps in the upcoming days. It was a difficult decision to make, but uh, is necessary in order to support my family and my family will always come first. I would like to thank all my uh, fellow members of council for providing me with support and alternate perspectives over the last seven years. Although we've not always agreed, I've always found your passion inspiring and your uh, friendship heartwarming. You've taught me so much. Thank you to all the people of Sogging Shores who voted me into office. I hope you have found me to be a worthy representative. I have tried my best to represent your issues with balance and with fairness. I'd like to thank the municipal staff. Your hard work and your diligence shows every day. You're the people who carry the largest load in making this community such a great place to live. And, and I'd like to thank the people who have had the courage to bring forward their ideas and deputation or an open forum over the years. Over the years, you've enlightened me, you've inspired me. Um, and you've taught me sometimes that we have to agree to disagree. To me, um, municipal councils are uh, more than a list of projects and operating costs, but in kind of a larger sense, an opportunity to help shape the vision or to form the trajectory of our community. And in my own small way, um, I've had an opportunity to take the torch from past members and to pass it forward. 
The way is always easier if your purpose is noble, they say. Although I've not often prepared statements in advance, I've always tried to do my research and stay open to different perspectives, searching for the shared goal or perhaps the compromise that could bring our group together. There are three pieces of advice my mother gave me as a young man when I left home, and I've always tried to keep them in mind in my journey through life, and especially in my time around this table, either uh, virtual or real. John, she said, the world doesn't owe you a living. It's something you have to make. And I've always tried to remember that when speaking and when listening. She said, being kind doesn't cost you a single cent. So I've always tried to be respectful and compassionate. And finally, she said, don't fall in love with the sound of your own voice. So I've always tried to listen more than I speak and be thoughtful when I had an opportunity to say my piece. Thank you to my wife, Tara, my sons, Leaf, Hyatt, and Ian. Thank you for putting up with my absence, my distractions, my long phone calls, strangers knocking at our doors to voice their concerns. My boys say that it takes forever to get anything done around this town because dad likes to chit chat. And I suppose that's true. For me, it's always the best part of the job. Have an opportunity to listen to people's concerns and see what I could do to help. There's still a lot of work left to do. And I feel confident that this group and this staff and this community to move forward and build a bright future while being mindful of our history and local heritage. I look forward to continuing to be a part of Sogging Shores community, albeit not seated amongst you at this council table, but I gotta say, I will miss it. So thank you guys. Thank you, uh, Council Rich. And uh, on behalf of uh, the people of the Town of Sogging Shores, on behalf of the preparation of the Town of Sogging Shores, I want to uh, thank you for your service uh, to uh, the community and to this council. Uh, I uh, have uh, always uh, enjoyed working with you. We first got to work together on the Community Liaison Committee for the DGR process, which was uh, interesting to say the least, and, an, and, a, uh, and a, a good opportunity to get to know you. And, and uh, very pleased when you were elected to council, got the chance to sit beside you for a term and, uh, and learn from you. And I, I think, uh, I mean, the way that you described yourself, uh, um, being open, uh, compassionate, and always looking for compromise. Uh, those uh, those uh, traits have always served you well and uh, have served this council extremely well uh, over the years that you have been a member of it. Uh, so you have made the community a better place for uh, your participation on this council and for having been a member of it. Uh, and uh, I'm very pleased to hear that uh, you're not going away entirely, that you're gonna maintain a home here and. Uh, and um, because I think uh, we need you to be part of this community, even if it's not uh, on a full-time basis. So, uh, so uh, thank you for your service and uh, we wanna wish you all the very best and I'm sure other members will have comments as well. We'll go to the deputy mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, tonight, I'd just like to congratulate Councillor Rich for his seven years of service to the municipality of Sogging Shores. He served as war counselor for Port Elgin and then for Southampton. His dedication, caring, compassion, and understanding is, is uh, unheard of. It's very good. He represents council well, and he helped make this council a very functioning group. He was, list he was able to listen, and he was able to articulate, and he was able to change my mind and, and keep me under control most of the time when, when my ideas would kind of wander. So... Councillor Rich, I wish you all the best wherever, well, where you're going. I try to talk you out of it, but I, I totally understand what you're doing and why you're doing it. And hopefully when things level out, you'll be back and maybe you'll run again in the future. All the best. Thank you. Vice Deputy Mayor. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And John, uh, thanks so much for uh, your, your, I mean, you're, you're, you're so well prepared with your, your notes this evening. I just want to thank you for all your, you know, your, your amazing service that you've given to our community the last seven years now, I guess. And one thing I've, well, confused well, many things I've admired about you, John, with your sincerity and very sincere person. You're very, always very professional. And, uh, and I've always found uh, you're, you're a great, great listener. And uh, but I wish, wish you and your family nothing but the best. I, I do want to apologize to you for not supporting your backyard chickens um, by law a few years ago. <laughs> But uh, John, we, we sometimes oh, remembered. <laughs> that might be the biggest news of the night. <laughs> sometimes we have to agree to disagree, right? But uh, 
No, you're very passionate about that. And one thing about it, John, when you were passionate about something, you you made your case and made it well. So just want to, uh, again, thank you for all you've done for council. Thank you, Councillor Schmidt. Thank you. Uh, to Councillor Rich, you and I started conversations about what it meant to be a, a member of this council uh, at hockey tournaments and, you know, at the arena. And uh, I have to say part of those conversations inspired me to be, be where I am today. So uh, for that, I thank you. And uh, we have been on the opposite side of the table, literally and, and sometimes metaphorically when it comes to decisions that have been made. And, and yet we've still been able to have those conversations both uh, in the room and outside the room that are cordial and respectful and, and all of the ways in which you've described. Uh, I agree with all the sentiments that have been said thus far and, and I wish you well on your journey. I know it'll be exciting wherever it takes you and I look forward to seeing it. Uh, I do have one note that is, is not related to Councillor Rich tonight that I would be remiss if I didn't make, uh, but I would like to acknowledge that um, CAO Caravan Mile and I did participate in the Association of Municipalities of Ontario conference last week and had an opportunity to present a delegation on a, on a concept that's uh, near and dear to your heart, Councillor Rich, so I know you'll be appreciative, but uh, we presented to the uh, Municipal Affairs and Housing um, the, the PA McDonnell and actually our MPP Lisa Thompson had an opportunity to pop into our virtual delegation as well. So we we're very privileged and honored to represent this municipality and talk about attainable affordable housing in our community. Uh, and I'm sure there'll be a report to follow. Perhaps Kara can weigh in in future weeks, but, uh, but I just wanted to make sure I expressed that to the team as well. Sure. Did you have a comment you wanted to make to that, Kara? Sure, through you, Mr. Mayor, if you'd like, I just wanted to update Council that uh, staff are meeting with the uh, Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing staff tomorrow to discuss the delegation and get some directions and next steps. So as uh, Councillor Smith indicated, we'll be back to you with a report to follow up on that. Excellent, thanks very much. Councillor Schreiber. Um, thank you, and to John, uh, you're a friend and you're somebody that I've always been able to reach out to and I am honored that I've been somebody that you've reached out to as well. Um, and if you've kept Donnie under control, who is gonna do that now? Um, I have no idea, uh, big shoes to uh, fill, but I, uh, you know how I feel about you. I respect you, I respect Tara, um, want only the best for you. Um, thank you for what you do um, collectively around that council table. But I also was a staff member when you were a member of council and you were a hell of a counselor then. And that means a lot for staff and they know that that uh, staff know that John Rich is in their corner. So thank you um, from that perspective as well and, and everything else that you guys do for this community here um, on and off the ice and in and out of the council chamber. So wish you well, buddy, and we'll talk soon. Thank you, Council Grace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, I'm John, um, you're a great friend. It's been um, a pleasure to serve with you as a, um, a member of council for our first term, uh, but then as a uh, co-ward uh, councillor in the second term. And um, I, I can say that you have lived up to your mother's advice. Um, absolutely. And um, I'm going to miss you. And uh, I'm glad you're not leaving us totally. And best of luck. Thank you, Council Mayette. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and through you, uh, John, what everybody said, I agree with it. We're going to miss you at the council table. You've been on council as long as I have, so it'll be, it'll be strange of being on a council without you. And uh, this is not goodbye. This is just good luck, and uh, we'll see you soon. And uh, as far as personal announcements go, uh, right now we're working on Stuff the Bus. So if anybody wants to contribute to the United Way Stuff the Bus program, the backpack program, it's in full sweep this week and, and last. And... Uh, there are ample ways to contribute if you go to the United Way webpage. See you, Johnny. All right. Thank you. Uh, Council or the Vice Secretary, any further than that? I just had one item, Mr. Mayor, for around the table, if I if I could. Uh, I, uh, it was just uh, next Wednesday. I'll, I, I think probably a good number of members of Council will be attending the uh, appreciation luncheon uh, for staff at the uh, at, at the Plex, and I just. I just wanted to give a, just an advance of the appreciation luncheon uh, a shout out to uh, 
and I for fear of missing anyone, but the, you know, we've our, our, our washroom cleaners, our grass cutters, our gardening crew, garbage crew, wall diamond crew, roads crew, uh, volunteer firefighters, aquatic staff, Mr. Mayor, and I know I've missed some and it's always dangerous mentioning uh, individuals and groups, but um, these people all do, you know, a wonderful job for our, our community. And I know they do receive some criticism from time to time from members of the public, but you know, these people, Put it, put it all out there and, and, and give, in my view, 100, 110%. And uh, I, I think it's wonderful that our CAO and, and staff, senior management, have uh, brought back the, uh, you know, the, the staff recognition luncheon uh, next, next Wednesday. So just want to thank all of our full-time and part-time staff for the great job they do. Yeah, thanks for those notes. And they, and they no longer have members of council flipping burgers for that event, which is probably best for staff and for council. So uh, we'll have a good lunch and uh, thanks for raising those points. So anyway, that brings us to the end of uh, uh, analysis by uh, members. And with that, we'll take a motion to adjourn. Councillor Rich and Councillor and the Deputy Mayor, all in favor. We stand adjourned and uh, uh, we will reconvene at uh, five to nine. Mr. Mayor, we have all members present. We still have Councillor Carr absent, but you may begin. Thank you, Linda. Then I'll call to order this regular council meeting. Uh, second item on the agenda is disclosures of pecuniary interest. Anyone have one of those I'd like to declare? Seeing none, of course, you can do that anytime you need to. We have no additions, deletions, or amendments. We have no public meetings. So that moves us on to adoption of minutes. And we have the regular council minutes of August 9, 2021, and the committee of the whole minutes of August 9, 2021. And there's a resolution that council adopt the minutes of the council meeting of August 9, 2021, and note and file the minutes of the committee of the whole meeting of August 9, 2021, as presented. Is there a mover and seconder? Moved by Mass and seconded by Rich. Questions or comments? Councilor Grace. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I would like uh, council to um, consider amending um, under 7.3.1 of the Committee of the Whole Minutes, bullet point five uh, reads uh, a request to review one-way streets, not only on third street in all cottage areas in 2022 as funding allows. And I believe that the discussion actually um, encompassed um, all cottage area streets, not just one-way streets, um, which the director, I reviewed the, the tape and the director has confirmed that that is her intention. So um, I would propose that that the minutes be amended in that way. Just to the clerk, is, it, is that uh, your understanding of, uh, is, that a, is that a good correction? Is that your understanding of how the meeting went? Yes, Mr. Mayor, that I reviewed it as well, and that is my recollection as, as well, and it reflects it accurately. Okay, is there any objection to considering the minutes as amended in the manner as suggested by the council? I see no objection, so we will uh, uh, consider the Committee of the Whole uh, minutes of August 9th, 2021 as amended. Uh, any other questions or comments? Seeing none, all in favor? That's carried. That moves us then on to reports of the Committee of the Whole. And the first one is a general government report regarding the 2020 year-end financial report and 2020 financial statements. And there's a resolution that council authorized the transfers to and from reserves and reserve funds as outlined in Appendix C of the CFO Treasurer's Report dated August 9, 2021. And that council accepts the 2020 annual audited statements as final. Is there a mover and seconder? Moved by Grace, seconded by Masson. Questions or comments to that resolution? Seeing none, all in favor. That's carried. That moves us on to the second report, which is an infrastructure and development report regarding the traffic bylaw, parking bylaw, and oversized load moving permit policy. And there's a resolution that council pass a bylaw to amend the traffic bylaw 103 2008 at a future meeting, and that council approve the oversized load moving permit policy. Is there a mover and seconder? Moved by Schreiner, seconded by Rich. Questions or comments to that resolution? Oh, the clerk. Uh, sorry, Mr. Mayor, I um, intended to have a, a different resolution on your desk there that referred to the parking bylaw. So where you have amend the traffic bylaw 103, um, it should also say end the parking bylaw. Actually, that's what's written on my screen and just not on my 
paper I read from the wrong spot. I chose the wrong. I flipped okay. it. I flipped a coin and read the wrong one. My apologies. You can no, no, that's fine. You can see that so everybody can see uh, the council passed bylaw to amend the traffic bylaw and the parking bylaw at a future meeting, and council approved the oversized load moving permit policy. So that's the resolution. Is that all right with the mover and seconder, Schreider, Rich? Yes. Okay. Then any questions or comments to the resolution? Seeing none. All in favor? That's carried. That moves us then on to item seven, reports of municipal officers and committees. And we have a staff report on the Ivings Drive and Goddard Street intersection award of tender. Give me a second here. We have a resolution that EC King Contracting be awarded the contract for the Ivings Drive and Goddard Street intersection reconstruction project in the amount of $662,051.50 plus applicable HST and the council allocate $290,000 from the future capital reserve to fund the project budget shortfall and that the mayor and clerk be authorized to sign the necessary documents as a remover and seconder. Moved by Mayette, seconded by Rich. Questions or comments to the resolution? Uh, Councilor Grace. And then the vice deputy mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I guess for the director, um, is it uh, possible that uh, staff would consider um, the comments of Mr. Minaj about the um, uh, the little drive that um, precedes the the right hand turn in the right hand turn lane going south? Thank you, and three, Mr. Not as part of this project. Um, I wouldn't want to add any increased costs into. Uh, this project, it is something that uh, we would we can look at. It would require a change to that site plan agreement with that developer, though, because that site plan is, is part of that, if if council so wishes. Okay, Vice Deputy Mayor. Yep, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll be supporting this recommendation. Um, I'm not uh, at all happy with 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 the price. I. I, I had a chat with our uh, with Amanda earlier today, and I was just asking her about the uh, you know the reasons why you know two or three hundred thousand dollars higher than what we were projecting. And I just want Amanda just if you might want to just share with council, you know the what, why the significant uh, overrun with with this project, and uh, you know what one bid obviously has an impact, and I guess asphalt pricing. But you can just outline just maybe. The benefit of all council. Why? Why such an overrun with this project? Thank you, thank you Mr. Mayor. The items that were uh, priced higher than we expected were the civil works, so the asphalt curb, those things. So there's a couple pieces that come into play with that. It's the time of tendering in the year. The contractors are already busy, so they have their their plates full of work um, to do that. We also need the work to be done before winter comes in, so that those two elements raise the price naturally for this. Uh, there are elements of working on a provincial highway that also tend to increase risk for, for contractors. So they, they need to take more time and traffic control those things. So it just becomes a, a higher price. Mm -hmm. And then um, mostly it's the, the time of year, but okay. I do still think that the prices are, they're not astronomical. So they are high and surprising, but we wouldn't be supporting this if we thought it was a t a terrible pricing. Just a comment, uh, Mr. Mayor, and I, I've been a long time advocate uh, of changing this intersection dating back to my first year in council as, as Councillor Mayat, and I've been very vocal about that intersection. And I think that this is something that's that's long overdue and, and uh, you know, in particular that traffic from three o'clock, six o'clock, you know, and boost power shift changes and so on and so forth in the lineup, people cutting through Circle K parking lot to avoid the light. And it's always been a problem intersection and, uh, you know, 50 cent dollars, good funding from the province. And uh, you'd hate to send a check for three or four, three or four hundred thousand dollars back to the province of Ontario. And, and uh, I'll take 50 cent dollars anytime. And, and uh, you know, we're growing to 20,000 people over the next uh, four or five, six, seven years and and um, eight years. And, um, you know, that we're just gonna get busier and busier and uh, that left-hand turn lane, uh, once once upon a time, I thought maybe just uh, advance green signal, but, uh, you know, having looked at it and studied it even further in discussion with Amanda, that left-hand turning lane, um, you know, is, is, is important to, for today for the future. So uh, I'll be supporting the recommendation. It's something that's long overdue. Okay, thank you. Further comments from members, uh, Council Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, I'll echo the Vice Deputy Mayor. This is something that him and I 
uh, both campaigned on it seven years ago, and uh, it's a long time coming. And it, to me, it's also a, a good example of changes that are being made that are adding to the efficiency of the flow of traffic through town. And it's my hope that this is uh, first of many improvements that we can make to get people who are coming through our town because like not everybody's coming to stay in, in soggy shores but people are moving through and to get people through faster and and ease the congestion particularly during the summer months uh, this is going to really help and uh, let's hope that we see some more of this thank you thank you i guess it's uh, it's not the first i mean we've been upgrading highway 21 for a long time for uh, and uh, but I'm sure there'd be many more upgrades uh, to come, and uh, and uh, uh, there's no question. This you know you only have to look at the subdivisions that are going to be constructed to the west of this intersection up on Blue Water Estates, and up there to see how many people are eventually going to live up there and are moving in there right now. To know that there have been awful lot of left turns at Ivings Drive in the future, and uh, we need to build good infrastructure. Good infrastructure is expensive, but it's going to serve our community really well going forward. So excited to see it advanced just as everyone is so if there's nothing further i'll ask all in favor of the resolution that's carried all right then that moves on to bylaws and there are uh three bylaws on the agenda this evening um does anyone wish to have any one of those uh, pulled out for individual consideration Elder Grace? uh yes uh Mr. Mayor, I'd, I'd request that um, the first uh, one on the list there, I've lost the number. Yeah, right that's now. 58 2021. Right. Yes, please. Okay. So the first one. Um, any other? Any others? Is there, uh, is there a mover and seconder for the entire resolution? I'll move <laughs> by Stephanie Ramayat and Galtor. I keep thinking Dave is moving stuff, but he's just swatting fly. Uh, <laughs> and rich all right um okay so i will uh, read the resolution in two parts then we'll take the first one first and then the other three a second i uh, move by uh, the vice deputy mayor second by council rich that the following bylaw is hereby read a first second and third time and finally passed and sealed this 23rd day of august 2021 one bylaw 58 2021 being a bylaw to authorize zoning amendment for 2536112 ontario incorporated uh is there questions or comments to the resolution Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? That's carried. All right, then that moves on to the final three. Uh, it's moved by the Vice Deputy Mayor, seconded by Council Ritz. So the following bylaws are hereby read a first, second, and third time, and finally passed and sealed this 23rd day of August 2021. Two, bylaw 59, 2021, being a bylaw to authorize official plan amendment uh, for 110 Godrick Street. Three, bylaw 60, 2021, being a bylaw to authorize official plan amendment for the employment lands. And four, bylaw 61, 2021, being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the council meetings of the town of Saugeen Shores. Uh, any questions or comments to the resolution? Seeing none, all in favor? That is carried. And finally, adjournment. I have a resolution that this regular council meeting of August 23rd, 2021, hereby adjourns at 9.08 p.m. Is there a mover and seconder? Moved by Matson, seconded by Rich. All in favor? Council stands adjourned. Have a good evening, everybody.